So, the main character's first thought when he was born in this world was why his vision was so distorted. Some girl turned to Mrs. Maya and said that she had a boy. The second girl said that he was finally born, and then asked him to give it to her. The girl says that his eyes are green, like his father's, and his hair is dark, like his. The maid says he looks like a king. The girl says it's true. She is sure that he will become an excellent ruler. The main character thinks that these girls said something about the ruler. He didn't understand where he was, where he was born, and why he understood their speech at all. The girl holds her son, and then says that her child will be called Raymond. She says that the boy will become the next king of the Centauro kingdom. The main character realized that he was reborn. Since the day of his birth, time has flown fast. Three months passed so unnoticed. By this time, memories began to come back to him. In a previous life, he lived on Earth. Was a full-blooded Japanese. He doesn't know why, but apparently he died. He asks to be allowed not to specify what he did in his previous life. For some reason unknown to him, he was born into the royal family of this world. In his previous life, he could have been called an adult man. But now he is a cute and small child with delicate skin. At first, when his memory returned, he was in despair, but after a few months he resigned himself. Although I didn't quite accept it, or rather, I put my thoughts in order. He had time to realize that he was just a helpless child, but with memories. And if you think about it, then maybe in a previous life he was a completely different person. His memories are constantly changing and with each change they are supplemented. But the main character was definitely not a small child, but also not an elderly person at all. The main thing is that now he is him. In three months, he realized that when the maids whisper like that, it means that the mistress is coming to him. The girl grabs the boy and tells him that he will become the next king. Then she says that the young man did not understand her. He is her son, the son of the first lady of the Ost Empire, so he will not lose to some son of the Duchess, and will become king. His mother's name is Maya, and she constantly says similar words to him. She may seem like a young girl, but in fact she is quite an adult girl. From her, the hero learned that he has brothers and sisters, which means that his father has other wives besides his mother. Therefore, if nothing happens, then his elder brother should become the heir. However, because of the behavior of the protagonist's mother, the servants do not want to contact him, and now he will start about his father. Suddenly, a man with long hair bursts into the room. He says he came to his son. The man tells Raymond to look at himself, and especially at his cute fatherly eyes. The main character tells that this man who is talking to him is the ruling king of the Centauro state. His name is Abram Centauro, the father of the main character. He stops showering the hero with words, saying how cute he is and how much he loves him, only when he kisses the young man. It seems to him that this negatively affects his self-esteem, and how this kingdom still exists with such a king. Dad dotes on his sweet son, and mom meanwhile says that Raymond should become king, although he does not understand what is happening in the world, but such an attitude is unlikely to affect him positively. There is another person he has met in these three months. She was a very nice maid. Her name is Maria, and she's Raymond's nanny. She is a lovely girl with a gentle nature. He thinks the girl is perfect. He can't give his dream wife to some leftist. But in fact, do not forget about their age difference with Maria. He can't propose to the girl who changed his diapers, but he's definitely not going to give her to the first person he meets. Maria tells the main character that everything will be fine. Mrs. Maya has high hopes for him, but she wants Raymond to know that she, too, will always be on the side of the young man. Maria says that the world is huge and full of amazing things that he doesn't even know about. The girl asks the gentleman to look out the window. She says that in that direction the homeland of Raymond's mother, Lady Maya, is the Empire of the East. That country is not at all like their country. There are very, very many mountains on its territory. Dragons live in the mountains, they are called God's Messengers. Dragons are very important to the Ost Empire. Many Imperial Knights are skilled dragon riders. The hero understands that there are dragons in this world. The hero begins to shout and chatter with his pens. Maria is surprised and says that Mr. Raymond likes dragons so much. Dragons are noble creatures. They are monogamous, they find one partner for life. That's why when people see a good and happy couple, they call them a pair of loving dragons. Dragons love each other very much. If one of them dies, then his partner will not stand it and will die of longing and loneliness. The girl says that dragons are also considered the ancestors of scaly reptiles from the neighboring kingdom of Rango Notos. The main character thinks that Maria is talking about lizard men. He is surprised that there are such creatures here. Maria says that this time the child was interested in scaly reptiles. She decides to tell Rengo Notos about the United Kingdom. The girl comes out of the nursery. The main character realizes that this is the first time he is taken out of the room. Since mom is the king's wife, she is rarely in the room, 
because she has a lot to do. Dad rarely comes into the room either. Maria used to worry about Raymond, that's why she couldn't stand it. But today is the long-awaited day. His room was full of furniture from medieval Europe, and when he got into the corridor, he saw that everything here was filled with the same atmosphere. A knight in armor approaches Maria and says that His Highness Raymond is with her today. The girl turns to Mr. Chris and greets him. The girl says she was wondering if she could show Mr. Raymond how it is outside here. Chris says it's a good idea and says he can accompany them. Suddenly Raymond notices a man's tail. Chris puts his hand to his helmet and says that Chris Narukos informs that Lady Maria and His Royal Highness need an escort, so a soldier is needed to guard the room. Raymond realized that Chris was now in contact with someone, but he did not understand how it happened. Chris says that the soldier will be here soon, so he asked to wait for him for a while and then go. Raymond tugged at a lock of Maria's hair. The girl asked what the gentleman needed. The girl guessed that it seemed strange to the kid that Chris was able to contact someone. The man comes up and says that really his highness has never seen a magic transmitter. Raymond smiles. Chris takes off his helmet. He was in the form of a cat, and an earring was attached to his ear. Chris said this earring is a transmitter. A spell has been cast into the stone. By investing your magic power, you can contact another person. Chris says it's a magic stone that allows you to contact anyone or just a magic transmitter. They call him Madden. The baby touches the earring. Chris is surprised and says that His Highness Raymond seems to be precocious. Any other child would have been happy to pull it. Maria says that Mr. Raymond is really very smart. It's like he understands everything they say to him. Chris replies that he can't wait to see what he will become in the future. Maria says that Mr. Chris is from the United Kingdom. Raymond thinks Chris doesn't look like a lizard man at all. Maybe the United Kingdom is a country where not people live. Chris asks if His Highness is interested in the United Kingdom of Rango Notos. Maria says she told him about the dragons of the Ost Empire. His Highness was very pleased with this, and the girl decided to mention scaly reptiles. She realized that Raymond was interested. Chris asked to be allowed to greet him properly. Chris takes the baby's hand and kisses the back of his hand. The hero thinks that he would have pulled his hand back if someone else had tried to do it. Even he, a man, can easily fall in love with this gallant cat, because there is something in him. The hero thinks that Chris gives the impression of a real gentleman. He decides that when he grows up, he will be the same gentleman as Chris. Chris then asks where she is going. Maria says she was thinking of showing His Highness the garden near Sophia's room, since only the eastern side is visible from Her Highness Maya's room. Looking at the south side of the garden, you can feel the atmosphere of the United Kingdom. Chris says there really is something like that out there, still not exactly what you can see on his rodite. Maria is sad and tells Chris that Mrs. Maya says that Mr. Raymond can become the crown prince. She hugs the baby and says that Mr. Raymond should also have a chance. She wants him to know not only about his native lands, but also about other countries and other races. Chris notes that Maria behaves like a real mother and he completely agrees with her. The order of succession to the throne is determined by the order of birth. However, it's not worth spreading too much about it. Even if His Highness Raymond becomes the heir, his relatives can become a serious obstacle. The hero thinks that Chris and Maria should not worry, because he does not want to cause them problems and is not going to fight for the throne. And it's impossible, because he has so many older brothers. Then the hero showed a desire to touch Chris. He had never cursed his short limbs like that. The kid starts reaching out to touch Chris. Maria starts screaming for Raymond to be careful. Chris also ran to catch Raymond in a panic. Chris and Maria, catching Raymond, hugged. They noticed that they were very close to each other and were embarrassed. Raymond notices this and thinks that they have already got married. He will do everything in his power to support Maria and Chris. Suddenly someone approaches them. Maria apologizes and tells Mr. Giancarlo that they made a lot of noise. The young man says that everything is fine and they should not worry. Then the young man notices the child in Maria's arms. Raymond tries to say something and Giancarlo starts beaming with joy. He begins to babble with the baby and notices his soft cheeks. The young man asks if this is Maria's child. The girl says that this is the son of Her Highness Maya and the younger brother of Giancarlo. The young man is surprised that this is his younger brother. Maria sits down on her knees. Giancarlo says that John lied to him and he still has a younger brother. Raymond thinks he doesn't know about John, so he assumes it's another relative. The young man asks Raymond to listen to him and, embarrassed, says that his name is Giancarlo and he is his older brother. Raymond notices that Giancarlo is very nice. Raymond is trying to figure out if he's really cute, because it's impossible to resist such cute young men. Giancarlo says that his brother can call him Jean. Only John is allowed to call him that, but Raymond is an exception. He asks Ray's brother and asks if he really left the room for the first time. 
he suggests taking a walk together. Chris says if Giancarlo doesn't mind that he will go with them too. He says that Lady Maria will carry His Highness Raymond, so she will not be able to take him, but Chris can carry him. The young man says that he relies on Chris, calling him a Naya Rukos. Chris says he will do everything in the best possible way. Raymond clenches his fist and thinks that Chris's teacher has excellent gallantry. After a while they arrive at the garden. Maria points to the plant and says that that sparkling thing is called a Waroiju. This plant looks like a dragon wrapped around a round gemstone. Then she shows the tree and says that if you make an incision, juice will flow out of it, so it is also called the Tree of Tears. In the language of Nodos, they are called Pasajirasu, which means dragon pearls and Hulan, which means tree tears. Jean tells Raymond that his mother is an elf, so he has even been to the south and it is very beautiful there. He suggests Raymond to go there together someday. Lemon understands that Jean is an elf, which is why he is so handsome. He even wonders why he didn't immediately pay attention to his ears. He understands that he has fallen right into a classic fantasy, and he has always wanted to meet an elf. He thinks that if there were an elf woman in this forest who looks like Jean and would play the harp, that would be fine. Suddenly Jean asks Chris to let him go. Then he runs up to some bushes and then runs up to Ray's brother. He puts a flower behind his ear and tells him that the red flower is Antares. In the language of flowers, it means that I will always love you. Maria says that Antares flowers are also called crystal flowers and they bloom very beautifully. When Raymond grows up and gets his room, she suggests planting these flowers in his room. Chris says that when the time comes, he will give Maria the seed of this flower. Jean says it's not fair, because he also wants to give something to Ray's brother. Jean touches Raymond's cheeks and says that maybe he is not as strong as John, but he is still his older brother, so no matter what, he will protect his brother. Jean says it's getting cold outside, so it's time for Maria and Raymond to return, and he will stay in the garden for a while. Maria says that in this case they will go first. Suddenly Jean has shortness of breath and, coughing, falls down. Suddenly there is another young man in the garden. He runs up to Jean and picks him up. He asks Jean what happened. The young man replies that everything is fine. He's just very happy, because he has a younger brother. The young man who holds Jean and says that he does not recognize this seventh scoundrel. Raymond grew up very naughty and constantly made Maria worry. Suddenly Raymond jumps out of the closet and scares Maria. The girl scolds Raymond in fright, but he makes a nice face and apologizes. Maria asks his highness how much you can indulge. She asks if Raymond wanted to meet his highness Giancarlo today. If yes, then you need to prepare. It's been five years since he first met Jean. All this time, he communicated only with him and was not familiar with other brothers. In addition, during these five years, he learned that he is the seventh prince in this royal family. His mother constantly told her son to become a king, and he, in fact, does not have a burning desire to become a king at all. Frederick and Orlando are the children of Queen Karina. Bertrand and Andre are the children of the second Queen Anastasia. Jean and Giovanni are the sons of the third Queen Sophia. Raymond doesn't know them at all and all because of his mother, who constantly says that he should become the next king, so he is just a hindrance to the rest of the brothers. He is still too young, so he is not allowed to go outside alone, so he played with Jean only in the four walls of his room or in the oriental garden. Finally, the day came when Maria said that the hero could go outside. It seems that Jean decided to have a tea party in the garden and it's all for his birthday. He is happy because the theme of the southern garden is a real fantasy beauty. Suddenly Chris comes into the room and says that he has come for Raymond. The young man runs to Chris and asks him to take care of him. The man tells Raymond not to doubt him, because he will do everything in the best possible way. Raymond wanted so much to go outside, but he couldn't, but today it will come to an end. Jean was standing in the garden, waiting for Raymond. Suddenly Jean notices his brother and sits down to hug him. Jean says he's been waiting for him. The brothers hug, but suddenly Jean starts coughing. Raymond asks if Jean is okay, but the young man replies that everything is fine and Ray should not worry. Even at their first meeting, Raymond found out that Jean was in poor health, but since there had been no seizures for a long time, he began to forget about it. Ray thinks that if he had been a doctor in a previous life, maybe he could have helped, but still, it's not really a disease. It seems that all children born as a result of mixing races have health problems for unknown reasons. If you manage to find the cause of the disease, you can leave no weak trace in history. Clearing his throat, Jean says that it's finally over. He apologizes to Ray, and then says that he has painted another picture and asks if his brother wants to look at it. Ray says he really wants to see it. Jean, like him, rarely goes outside, so he is addicted to drawing and Ray must say that Jean is doing great. Jean says that Naruko's and Maria can't go any further, because here they have a secret place with Ray. 
Maria says that there is a protective barrier in the southern garden, so they have nothing to worry about. Chris says that if a friend wants something, then they can immediately call them. Jean and Ray head to the back of the garden. Suddenly Jean steps on a crystal flower. He says it's Antares, and then asks Ray if he likes this flower. Ray says that Jean gave this flower to him the first time he met, so he really likes this flower. Jean is surprised that Ray remembers what happened when the boy was still very young. Ray realizes that it's strange that he remembers something so long ago. Jean then asks the young man if he still remembers what Jean said then. Ray says that Jean wanted to give him something back then. Jean turns around and tells Raymond to follow him. The young man takes his brother by the hand and they walk through the garden. Raymond begins to shine and says that it is incredibly beautiful here. Then Jean invites Ray to go to the gazebo to drink tea. John was sitting there. The young man said that he understood where Jean was going behind his back, namely, to meet with Ray. Jean asks John why he came here. Jonah points a finger at Ray, and the boy falls. John tells Jean not to forget that he is not only his younger brother, but also the heir to the throne. He looks threateningly at Raymond and tells him to know his place. Raymond thinks that John is Jean's own brother, as well as the fifth crown prince, Giovanni Santoro. Jean covers Ray with himself and tells John that only Mrs. Maya says so, and Ray is not to blame. John asks Jean if he can prove it, namely whether he really doesn't need the throne. Jean says he knows for sure that Ray doesn't need the throne. John says that only Jean thinks this, and he himself is only the son of Mrs. Maya. Jean shouts that Ray is not like that. John says that he is doing all this for protection, because Jean is his brother, and Jean shouts that Ray is also John's brother. John puts his hand on Jean's cheek and says that Ray is a stranger to him and he has no blood connection with him, and Jean is very dear to him. Raymond thinks that Jean has always protected him, so he doesn't want Jean to fight with John because of him. Jean turns around and says that Ray has done nothing wrong and he will protect him. Suddenly, the young man starts coughing very loudly. John says it's all because of Raymond, and then pushes the hero away. Lemon doesn't understand and says what John is talking about. The young man begins to cry and says that whenever Ray is around, Jean always overstresses because of him. Raymond was surprised by this. John was supposed to be 14 this year. In Japan, at the age of 14, you are still a schoolboy, that is, quite a child. So Ray understands the heartache that Giovanni is experiencing. For John, brother Jean is the closest person. He probably always takes care of him when Jean has another attack. He wants to protect him with all his heart. Raymond gets up and shouts to brother John to get Maria and teacher Chris here, and then asks him to hurry up. Ray is only five years old, so John, at 14, will be faster than him. John frowns and says that he will have to leave Ray alone with Jean. Ray says they have no other choice. John starts to grin and says that as soon as he leaves, Ray will immediately take advantage of it. He tells Ray not to make him laugh, because Jean is his brother and he will protect him. Ray gets angry and then he starts yelling at John and orders him to shut up. He says that if John doesn't call for help, he will do it and let John stay here. Ray turns around and finally tells him that John should continue to watch Jean suffer in his arms, because there is nothing he can do. Ray runs to call for help and wonders if he will hurt Jean, and then replies that he will never do it. He is not sure that they can be called brothers, but although they have different mothers, brother Jean has always taken care of him, so he cannot leave him. But in this body, he will not be able to quickly get to Maria and Chris's teacher, and the noise of the trees and the singing of birds drown out his cry. But one thing is clear, we urgently need to find a solution. Something will be able to make a loud sound and attract attention. He remembers the fireworks. At one of the lessons, Chris's teacher told him about magic. He told Ray a lot about her, he was too much interested in her. As it turned out, he has a talent for magic, so now he can already use simple magic. For example, cooling or heating. He wants to see if he can use other magic. Ray makes a serious face and thinks that for the sake of brother Jean, he has no choice. Chris remembers that in order to use magic, you need to know the spell. If the magician does not know the spell, then you can imagine a clear image of what the magician is trying to conjure. Ray thinks that first you need to imagine a transparent sphere, and now there is a quartz flower inside it and collect water from the air around, and then put everything in the sphere. Now Ray understands that it is necessary to throw the sphere high so that it can be seen from afar. It is necessary to imagine that gravity does not act on the sphere, so it will take off. Although Ray has little magical power, he has no right to make a mistake. Ray raises his hands up. The temperature of the shell of the sphere increases rapidly, and the water inside retains a cold temperature, and then explodes in the sky. John, Maria and Chris see the explosion. Ray understands that when you want to protect your family, you become stronger. At this time, everyone in the palace was alarmed 
because an explosion was heard from the southern Sama and everyone decided that they were attacked. The man standing at the window said that everything was very interesting. Smoke from the explosion was heard in the southern garden. Chris and Maria saw the smoke. John also saw this signal. Ray pointed his hands up and asked to save brother Jean. Chris suddenly appeared next to Ray and shouted the names of His Highness Raymond and His Highness Jean. Ray tried to talk about everything, but Chris grabbed him in his arms. Chris shielded them with himself and said how could he not notice that someone had made their way into the garden. He tells Ray to sit on his hands for now, and then says he can't smell enemies. Raymond turns Chris's face and says that he conjured this explosion. Chris asks if Ray really did it. Raymond says it's more important now that brother Jean is in danger. Chris turns to the transmitter and says that Chris Narukos is reporting and that doctors are urgently needed in the southern garden. After a while, Jean is put on a stretcher. Chris approaches Raymond and says that everything will be alright now. Jean suddenly asks people to stop and turns to Ray. Ray approaches Jean, and Jean thanks Raymond. Chris watches Jean and says something about this explosion. Raymond says he conjured this explosion. John comes up to him from behind and puts his hand on his shoulder. The young man says that he can confirm that Raymond is not lying. Everyone around began to whisper that at this age he has great strength. People say they have the same talent for magic as Bertrand. Then someone asked if it was not dangerous, because he was the child of Mrs. Maya, and if Giancarlo was in such a state because of Raymond. Raymond thinks his mother is constantly telling him to become king. Naturally, if her son pulls such a trick with an explosion, then he will be suspected of everything. Usually a young man doesn't care what others say, but today is his birthday, and Ray is Maya's son, that's why brother John and the servants are so attuned to him. He clutches his shirt on his chest and says that even if he wishes and if he says back, Ray turns to Chris and says that he wants to go back to the room. Then he asks to tell about the condition of brother Jean. Chris reaches out to Leon and says that he will take him to the room. But suddenly Raymond slaps Chris on the arm and firmly says that he can walk himself, and then runs away. Chris doesn't understand what happened, and then asks his highness to wait. Maria turns around and sees Raymond behind her. Ray asks Maria to listen. The girl approaches and asks what happened. Raymond asks what he should do now. From the moment he was born, Raymond thought about why he was reborn and kept the memory of his past life. All older brothers have their own role. Crown Prince Frederick helps his father with his duties. Andre and Orlando are studying to be diplomats. Bertrand, after finishing his studies, began teaching. Brother John is a musical genius, also very charismatic. Brother Jean is very kind and draws beautifully. And what can Raymond do? He has no talent for art. His mother keeps pushing him. There is no war, so there is no point in getting stronger. Then he realizes that he can get stronger to become an adventurer. But he doesn't really want to become a hero. He wants to find himself in this world. If he had been born into the commoners and not into the royal family, then perhaps it would have been better. Ray doesn't understand why. Being a prince, he can't go outside of his own room. Why, when he has brothers, he can't even talk to them. He thinks about why no one wants to listen to him. Why do the servants make terrible faces when they see him? He does not understand what he has done and why he is so despised. He doesn't say that Chris and Maria aren't enough for him. He just wants to be understood, as his brother Jean understood. He thought he could put up with it, but he had to wait. The young man begins to cry, because he is very lonely. Maria hugs him to her chest and turns to Mr. Raymond. She asks Raymond not to keep the tears to himself, because she will always be there for him and will not go anywhere. That's why she asks not to keep Raymond's tears to himself. Ray starts crying, and Maria says that she understands how he feels, so she asks him to tell her everything. A few days later, Maria comes into the room and asks if Raymond really won't come out today. The young man says that even if he goes out, he will regret it, so he will stay in the room. Raymond became a real recluse. Somehow he was tired and he didn't care what others said. He didn't even answer them if they talked about him. Meyer also constantly told him complete nonsense. If she wanted to, she could help him. He is angry that his mother threw everything on the shoulders of a five-year-old child. Maria says that Jean and John sent Ray an invitation to a tea party. Lemon is surprised that the letter came not only from Jean, but also from John. Maria says that's right, and they call the young man to the southern garden. Ray turns around and says he doesn't want to go because he's already seen everything there. Maria says that in this case he will refuse. Ray decided that he would not go outside the walls of his room, only if he went to the oriental garden. He's from the royal family and can't show his face to the world. He's definitely not going to leave his room for the next seven years. He will be a recluse. Maria closes the door, and then someone approaches her. Chris says, turning to Ray, can he come in? Ray allows it. 
The man says that the explosion in the southern garden is really the work of a gentleman. Ray turns around and says that he has already answered this question. He sees Chris's depressed face and is surprised. Ray apologizes and says he shouldn't have raised his voice, but he thinks he was just sent to ask this. Chris says it doesn't offend him at all. Chris says that if it's so unpleasant for Ray to remember about it, then he asks for forgiveness. Ray says it's okay. Then the young man asks what Chris wanted to know. Chris asks if the young man would mind talking to him. Raymond smiles and says that if it's Chris, then he can't refuse. Chris is surprised, and then says why others have such an opinion about him. If they had taken a closer look at the young man, they would have realized that he did not need the crown prince's place. Raymond says he's glad that at least Chris believes it. Chris says Raymond is too kind. Raymond tells Chris not to worry about him, because they will never leave him. Chris says that Ray can't argue. Chris says that when he gets really old, he will stay on Raymond's side. Then Ray asks why Chris came here after all. The man apologizes, and then asks if Ray can go somewhere with him, namely to the Northern Garden. Raymond thinks that recently he swore to become a real recluse, but he lied. Then he hears the maids whispering and starts covering his face with bangs. The corridor seemed very cramped to Raymond and he felt somehow uncomfortable. At this time, Chris's entire fur stood on end. Ray says he shouldn't pay attention to it. Let them say what they want, because it doesn't matter. He translates the topic and asks Chris to talk about the Northern Garden. Suddenly a man standing nearby starts talking. He said there were two northern gardens. Sybil flowers grow in one. The contrast between the blue sky and the flowers is beautiful, and he really likes it. Raymond recognizes the man as his brother Bertrand. He understands that he has never communicated with him, but he is one of his brothers, namely the second prince, Bertrand Centoro. The man says that the second garden is the most important. He says that it is better to see him with his own eyes, and then says that he will take the young man there and at the same time talk to him. After a while they arrive at the second northern garden. Raymond notices an unusual flower. Bertrand asks if Raymond is seeing this flower for the first time. It's called Tiagar. You won't see this warm shade in Sybil. After a while, Raymond shivers from the cold. Chris says that the young man feels cold for the first time. The young man understands that this is really the first time. There is no climate change in this world. In warm countries it is always warm, and in cold countries it is cold. This place is separated by a thin border like a magic veil. Bertrand puts his hand into the veil and says that it is better to feel it than to listen to stories, and then he goes inside. Ray realizes it's magic, and then he follows his brother. He sees a huge winter garden. All the trees were covered in ice, and the earth and sky were white. Chris asks Ray to put on his uniform, and he says that he will carry him in his arms. Then he notices the flowers that Bertrand showed him, but his color is different. The man says that these flowers change their color depending on the temperature, so in cold places they have such a purple or blue shade. Then Raymond calls brother Bertrand and asks him the name of the tree standing next to him. Bertrand says that this tree is called Livea, some call it simply frost, but these are completely different things. He asks what Ray thinks about it. The young man thinks about it and says that the frost just covers the ice on top of the tree, but this tree is entirely made of ice. Bertrand says that Lee answered correctly, and then asks, as he thought, that the young man is smarter than an ordinary child. Ray is surprised, and Bertrand says that they will continue the conversation inside the hut. Ray asks about the cabin. Bertrand replies that it is a hut. He says his servant should have already prepared the tea. Ray thinks this hut is bigger than a Japanese traditional house. Bertrand says Chris probably froze in his shirt, too. The man replies that nothing is like that, because he is covered with wool. In addition, he holds his highness in his arms, so he is very warm. Raymond begins to shine although he says that he is covered with fur, but it cannot be that he is not cold. He says that the teacher has a very great endurance, and he is also a real handsome man. Ray considers the teacher an ideal. Bertrand calls Ray and Chris to come inside. After a while, Raymond and Bertrand are sitting at the table. Ray realizes that even though they are on the terrace, it is warm here. Bertrand says they'll get right to the point. Bertrand seriously asks how the young man could conjure such a big explosion. Raymond replies that he caused the explosion with water vapor. Bertrand repeats about the water vapor and asks if Raymond really used water magic and raised the temperature. Ray replies that there was no water nearby, so he imagined water gathering from the air around. Bertrand asks again about the water from the air, and then says that he certainly thought about it, but it's impossible. He didn't understand where the water came from in the air. He says that if you boil water on fire, steam appears. If you continue to boil it further, all the water will boil away. He asks where she goes then, because she couldn't just disappear without a trace. He thinks he learned it in a modern science class in Japan. 
Bertrand says that's why Raymond assumed there was water in the air. Then the man smiled. Bertrand gets up and says that, as he thought, keeping Raymond in the shadow of his mother is very stupid. He holds out his hand to him and says that Raymond would not like to teach at the academy with him. Bertrand is serious, and Raymond is very surprised by his brother's proposal. Raymond says he could certainly teach elementary education. Bertrand says that primary education is just teaching the basics of academic knowledge, and the man is talking about something completely different. Secondary education is teaching the basics of witchcraft. Raymond will continue his magical studies at the senior level. Bertrand believes that the research of the magic of their world should continue no matter what. Every kingdom must have one school or academy. The Academy of the Kingdom of Centro is the largest in the world. In the third grade academy, commoners and aristocrats of low rank receive a general education. The study of various specializations is secondary education. There is also a faculty for any profession, for example, the faculty of magic. Teaching the basics of teaching at the academy is a senior education. Only those who received excellent grades in high school, then received higher grades in high school, are already allowed to teach at the academy. Such big words, and Brother Bertrand is an acting professor at the academy. He doesn't even know that there is water in the atmosphere, although even the scant knowledge of the main character is enough. He thinks that this world is still a long way from Japan. However, the young man does not like to study, so I would like to refrain from studying. Raymond says he doesn't want to study. Bertrand says that not using Raymond's intelligence is a great loss for society. He says he will tell Bertrand everything he knows, and he, in turn, will be able to publish it all on his behalf. The man bangs his fist on the table and starts to get incredibly angry. He says that he is not so pathetic as to appropriate the result of his younger brother's research. Raymond apologizes. Bertrand says that he shouldn't have shouted, so he also apologizes, and then says that he is not going to appropriate other people's work because he will not be satisfied with such a rise in his career. He would talk to Raymond and realize that he was much smarter than Bertrand himself and had a kind of talent. He doesn't want his brother's talent to be shut down because of his mother, and it's not just his talent. To put it bluntly, Bertrand is worried about Raymond. The hero realizes that this is why he called him to this hut, where the maids cannot follow. Raymond's mother has servants and they almost worship her. If they found out that his brother wanted to distance him from his mother, they wouldn't just leave it like that. Ray asks if Bertrand really put Chris up to it. The young man understands that it must have been very troublesome to pull it all off, so also to find such a place. Raymond says brother Bertrand is very cunning. Bertrand smiles and says that it would be better to call him a tactician. Raymond asks his brother if he found out what he wanted. Bertrand says that he learned what he wanted most, but new questions arose. Since there are no extra ears and eyes here, the young man suggests discussing all this. Bertrand agrees and says they will have a constructive conversation. Until now, no one has taken Ray, who is a five-year-old child, seriously. Some picture books and toys for children. It was too much for him with the mind and values of an adult. Ray asks if half-humans really have the abilities of both humans and another race. The brother replies that, in general, Half-humans look more like inhumans than humans, so they are closer to inhumans. Ray asks if her brother has studied their blood before. Bertrand replies that he did nothing of the kind. Ray replies that they cannot judge their nature based only on external signs. The brother does not communicate with Ray as with a five-year-old. The hero's goal is to find out why Jean's body is so weak. Children born of mixed races always have some kind of defect. Ray's father wants to improve relations with the United Kingdom, so Sophia, the daughter of the Elf King, a representative of the United Kingdom, became his concubine. From their union, Jean and Giovanni were born, but as everyone feared, Jean and John were born with defects. Jean's body is very weak, and he is always tired and has anemia. John's body is fine, but he can't use even the simplest magic. Ray is trying to understand why this happened, because the reasons are still unknown. Bertrand says he suspects the problem is related to a fundamental aspect of their species. At the moment, the only theory is that humans are an inferior race, and all inhumans are superior races. The body is unable to hold the energy of other races, so it weakens, and even when the forces disappear, it is the reaction of the body in an attempt to protect the body. That's because people are closer to spirits, and whether people can use magic or not depends on their talent. Inhumans can all use magic, but half-breeds can be an exception. Half-breeds usually turn out to be outcasts in human society, because they most often inherit the external signs of inhumans. They say they bring bad luck. Ray realizes that everything is so obvious. He says the problem could be human DNA. Bertrand said that magic depends on talent. 
Dark skin is a dominant feature and is inherited, so the child will be born mulatto, but within humans and people things are the same. Ray says that children from such a marriage will inherit the characteristics of both races. Whether people can use magic depends on their talent, so it's possible that half-breeds can use magic only if they have talent. Bertrand is surprised that this is the reason. A half-breed inherits magical powers, but cannot use it if there is no talent. He asks how Ray will explain their weak bodies. The young man says that he cannot answer this question without studying the differences in the lives of humans and inhumans. He asks who lives longer. Bertrand replies that inhumans have a long duration. He asks if they have any dietary peculiarities and if they move a lot. Bertrand gives a positive answer. Ray says what will happen if the inhumans don't eat right. Elves eat from nature, beastmen eat raw meat, lizardmen replenish their strength with water. They don't all eat like humans. Despite the fact that the semi-mallards have passed on human nutrition organs, they can poorly digest human food. Maybe they just don't have enough nutrients. Bertrand talks about the wrong diet, and then asks Ray if he wants to say that they just don't have enough proper nutrition. He asks if he is offering Giancarlo to eat the same as people. Ray is very surprised and asks if Brother Jean is now eating what the elves eat. Bertrand says this is absolutely true. Fatigue and anemia. If you think about it, these are all symptoms of malnutrition. Ray wonders why he didn't think of it right away, because it's obvious. Ray asks why in 10 years no one thought that it could be a normal malnutrition. Bertrand asks what is malnutrition. He says Ray's theory sounds plausible. He offers him to open a medical institute. Ray knew that science in this world is completely undeveloped, which means that medical knowledge here is at a terrible level. Raymond knocks his hands on the table and tells everyone to bring meat and fish to Brother Jean right now, as well as more rice and soybeans. Then his gaze was full of malice, and his loud voice resounded like thunder through the room. Chris whispered that he would never want to see him like this again. The young man apologizes that he had to see it. One year has passed. Maria comes to Raymond's room and says that Mr. Giancarlo and Mr. Giovanni have come. Ray tells them to come in. Jean asks Ray how he's doing, and John says that they came today too. Ray turns around and says that they saw it yesterday. From that day on, Jean began to eat normally and he quickly felt better. Brother John came to apologize for what happened in the garden and also thanked him. Now he and Ray are getting along. Jean says they brought cookies, and then he asks Maria to make tea. Suddenly Jean notices a noose tie around Ray's neck. He says he made the tie, and Ray says he gave it to him. Ray remembers the occasion when Jean gave him this accessory in the Southern Garden. John changes the subject and asks if Raymond is really sitting in his room today. The young man replies that it is. Even if he leaves the room, no one will be happy about it. Ray says that today he has a fencing lesson with Chris, and then his brother Bertrand will come to teach him, and Jean and John come to visit him every day, so he cannot leave the room, because he is having so much fun. Jean takes Raymond's hair and says that it has grown very much. Ray says that the green color of the eyes is peculiar only to the royal family. Because of his eyes, people see him as the crown prince. Jean says that's why he hides them. He slaps Raymond in the face with the words that he can show them to them. Then there are two hairpins on Raymond's forehead. Jean takes Ray by the face and says that he really likes his beautiful eyes. Raymond says he has the same eye color. Shan is one of the musical instruments that brother John can play. It seems this tool is being used to celebrate meeting others in the United Kingdom. John starts playing the instrument, and Jean sings a song. The whole room is illuminated by a wonderful light. Ray starts clapping his hands and says it was just fine. Jean and John blush with embarrassment. Jean falls to the floor and tells John that he has such a cute little brother. John pats him on the back and tells him that he and his younger brother. Ray thinks that there are few people from his family who communicate with him, so John and Jean are incredibly dear to him. Raymond says clearly into the whole room that he loves John and Jean. The two brothers turn to Ray, and then begin to tremble with surprise. They run to Ray and hug him. Jean hugs Ray and says that he loves him very much too. John pats Ray on the head and says that he does not hate him either, because he is another of his dear little brother. Some time later, at night, Raymond's mother calls him and says that he must definitely become the heir. His father will notice Ray someday, because he really deserves to be the heir. She looks at her son and says that he has his father's eyes and her hair. He must definitely become the heir and ruler of this kingdom. Raymond has been hearing the same thing all these six years. He dutifully agrees with the matter, because this woman does not accept another answer. The woman madly looks at her son and calls him her beloved Raymond and says that only he remains on her side. She starts crying and asks her son not to leave her alone. Raymond realizes that his mother is very lonely. Immediately after giving birth, because of her loud statements, she was shunned. 
She is always nervous in the presence of Raymond's father, and her father mistakenly thought that she hated him and therefore stopped coming into her room. Raymond's mother has always been interested in his father, which is why she wants Ray to become the heir. She's always sulking when no one takes her seriously. As a result, she became very dependent on her son, the only one she could talk to. The mother asks Ray if he loves her. The young man does not know what to answer. He agrees with the words of his mother, but in his head he tries to be like an ordinary child. The woman gets up and says that it can't be otherwise, because her son can't hate her. The woman leaves, and Maria turns to the gentleman and asks if she can bring him a glass of hot milk. The young man agrees. In the end, he is the only one who noticed that his parents were moving away from each other. He thinks whether he should intervene and whether the child should change something. He understands that he can't give up so easily. Just complaining about problems, he will not be able to get rid of them. Maria enters the room, and the young man addresses her. He says he wants to talk to his father, and then asks how he can meet him. Maria is surprised. After a while, Raymond came to his father. The man said it was very rare. He hugs his son and says that his beloved Rachik wanted to meet him for the first time. Raymond turns to his father and says that he is no longer a small child. The elder brother and first prince Frederick Santoro puts his hand between Raymond and his father and then says that Raymond has a serious conversation. Raymond realizes that his brother Frederick saved him from his father's caresses. The man turns to his son and asks what he wanted to talk about with his beloved daddy. The boy says that it may sound a little rude, but he asks his father to stop his antics and start communicating with his mother again. The man says that his mother doesn't like him at all. Raymond says her father is hurting her. He can't believe that his father doesn't understand that his mother is a tsundir. He asks who he thinks he is, if he is not the owner of a harem. The father and the elder brother stood and did not understand what was happening and what the young man was talking about. Raymond says his father annoys him. He asks how many women his father has already met, and Raymond's mother is very nice. The man asks Raymond where he learned such words. Raymond asks what the difference is. He takes the man by the face and says that his mother loves his father very much. So much so that she can't even talk to him normally. Besides, she is inexperienced and what kind of behavior he expected from her. The young man asks the man if he knows why Ray's mother wants him to become the crown prince. The man replies that it's because she wants to be in power. Ray says this is completely wrong, because she loves Father Raymond very much. He quotes her saying that he has her dark hair and his green eyes. He is so cute and if he can become the heir to the throne, then he will finally be able to come to her. Even if a man does not love her, but she really wants him to come and at least visit her. The man looks at his son, and then asks him if he knows if Meyer is in her room today or not. The young man answers, it should be there. The man smiles and offers Raymond to go with him. The man asks Frederick if he wants to go with them. Frederick says that his father constantly loses track of time when it comes to family, so he will finish the work himself for now. Raymond apologizes to his brother, but the young man coldly replies that he should forget about it. The man takes Raymond in his arms and says that he has not squeezed his son for a long time, and then says that Raymond has gained a little weight. The man says he doesn't like being a king because he is very lonely and he can't even keep track of his own son's growth. Ray asks if his father is really lonely too. The man gives a positive answer. The man says about Ray's mother that she would prefer to have a full-fledged spouse, but is only the fourth wife. He says that she has become dearer to him than anyone else. He was trying to stabilize the situation in the country, so they saw each other less and less, and eventually he lost sight of the most important thing. He says that sometimes he wonders why he lives at all. The man smiles and says that he has strange thoughts, and then tells Ray that he probably doesn't understand. Ray thinks that he used to think that a man was just a kissing demon, but it looks like it's time to change his mindset. Raymond says that he loves his mother more than his father because he spends more time with her. The man gets upset because it's true. Raymond grabs his father's cheek and then kisses him on the cheek and says that he also loves his father because he does everything possible for all of them, and Ray knows it. The man says that his son is a real angel and then tries to kiss him, but Raymond evades and says that they already need to enter the room. The man is going to knock on the door and says it's time to take full responsibility. Meanwhile, Maya was sitting in her room and wondering on a flower whether Abram loved her or not. Suddenly she hears a knock on the door and says that whoever it is, but he can come in. Abram falls into the room and smiles. He greets Maya and says that they haven't seen each other for a long time. The girl with a stony face turns in the direction of the newcomer. Then she starts to glow and blush all over. From fright, she runs up to the curtains at one moment and tries to cover herself. The girl, all scared, asks Abram why he came here. He says that you can't go into a girl's room so suddenly. 
The man asks for forgiveness. The girl asks what's the use of apologies and asks not to do it anymore. Raymond knocks his father on the back and says that his mother meant that next time he would definitely warn her so that she would have time to dress up. Maya shyly calls her son. She says she won't preen for Abraham. Raymond says she doesn't mean it. Maya screams and asks which side Ray is on. The young man says that he is on his mother's side, but calls his father to hug her. Abram stands dumbfounded and then tries to hold back his laughter. He starts laughing and says he didn't know that Maya is actually very cute. He approaches Maya, who is hiding behind a curtain. The girl shudders and asks Abram not to approach. Raymond translates this to the fact that the girl is very shy and asks not to walk. Abram says it's good that Ray translates. He asks for forgiveness and then hugs Maya. He apologizes to her and says he didn't understand her true feelings, and then calls himself stupid. He says that now he will spend more time with a girl. Tears begin to flow from Maya's eyes. The girl starts crying and asks why Abram has just decided to say all this. The man says that he understands this, but asks for forgiveness. The girl says she will never forgive him, and she cries in his arms. Raymond thinks that for his mother, his father was the most influential person in the world. It was too much for her young age, so she must have been very worried when she was married off. My father turned out to have such a gentle and caring character, so it's not surprising that such a shy girl eventually fell in love with him. On the other hand, the father did not know at all how to behave with a girl who is much younger than him. Raymond pats them on the heads and says that now they will talk to each other and yet, he turns to his mother and says that if she cannot express her love in words, then she must show it by actions. He says that he went to his brother Frederick, and then turns around and says that he wants a younger sister. Maya begins to get very confused, and Abram asks the young man if his younger brother will suit him. Maya is even more embarrassed, and Raymond says that the younger brother is also very good. He walks into the office and tells brother Frederick that he's back. Sullen Frederick asks where his father is. Raymond says he's talking to his mother. He asks if he can be here. Frederick gives a positive answer. A man calls Raymond and asks him to sit down in this place. The man says that he is Frederick's servant and his name is Bernardo Bernini, and they are meeting for the first time. Raymond says Bernardo is from the Bernini family. The man is surprised that the young man knows about this. The Duchy of Bernini is related to the first Queen Carina, which means that brother Frederick and Bernardo are cousins. Bernardo says that when Frederick was the same age as Raymond, he was not very interested in some kind of ducal house. Frederick asks why he is telling this. Bernardo asks Raymond to help himself to tea. Raymond is surprised and thanks Bernardo. The man says that the young man is very polite, but it is not necessary to talk to him so formally. Ray says Bernardo is older than him. He says that, in addition, he planned to move out of here to the city. Bernardo and Frederick jump up from their seats and ask what the young man is talking about. Raymond says that his mom is constantly making a fuss, so it won't be funny at all if family feuds start because of him. He doesn't want to become the crown prince, so it would be nice to get rid of all this. Frederick menacingly asks if Frederick is really going to leave. The young man gives a positive answer. Frederick continues to push and says that Raymond will not leave if no one pushes him to become crown prince. The young man agrees. Raymond says that brother Frederick hates Raymond. Frederick is covered with a stone, and Bernardo laughs. Frederick says he always thought Raymond was his dear little brother. Bernardo laughs and says that Raymond is the best, and he tells Frederick that he has a terrible face. Raymond says he thinks Frederick has too many facial muscles that don't function except between his eyebrows. Because of this face, Frederick is constantly shunned by John, and Jean immediately begins to cry. Bernardo tells Frederick that Raymond always thought he hated him. Raymond tells his brother that he'd better talk more. Frederick says it's just a shame, and Bernardo says he just destroyed it. Frederick clears his throat and tells Raymond that he could not then chat with him from time to time. Raymond says he would love to have a cup of tea with his older brother if he doesn't mind. Frederick begins to shine with joy. Bernardo says that Frederick was lucky because he always liked Raymond. Frederick blushes and asks Bernardo not to say too much. The man says he will let you know when the tea ceremony is ready and Bernardo will give it to Raymond. Ray relies on Bern. The man says he is glad that Raymond calls him that. Raymond says he can just call him Ray. Meanwhile, Frederick begins to wobble from side to side. Raymond notices him. Frederick is embarrassed and asks Raymond if he can call him Ray too. Raymond thinks that Frederick's brotherly instinct has worked. Raymond agrees to his brother's request. Frederick mutters Ray's name under his breath, but Raymond asks him to speak more clearly. The man approaches his brother and pats him on the head, and then says that he will look forward to when they talk over tea together. Raymond is surprised, and Bernardo says that when Mr. Giancarlo got worse, Frederick was very worried. 
Ray says he'll be waiting for that day too. Then he puts his hands to the side and says that since they are a family, they can hug. He tells Frederick that he can spend some time as a father, who constantly hugs and kisses him. Frederick says that Raymond is right, and then he sits down on his knees and hugs his brother. He tells him to come more often. Raymond agrees. After a while, Ray returns with Bernardo. He is met by Jean and John. Jean then asks if Ray really came with Bernardo. Ray says Bayan was just seeing him off. Bernardo says that he has not seen Mr. Giancarlo and Mr. Giovanni for a long time. Jean and John get scared. Raymond says what Byrne did to those two. Bayan says Jean and John's reaction is wonderful. Ray asks what Byrne did to them. Byrne says that Frederick has a scary face, and he just stood behind and looked at Jean and John when they were very scared. Raymond punches Byrne in the side. He calls him a scoundrel. Bayan apologizes and then says he'll be back. Jean asks Raymond what Bernardo did to him. He asks if the young man is alright and if all his limbs are intact. Ray says that everything is fine, and he was just talking to his brother Frederick, which is why he met Byrne. Jean and John are scared and surprised that Ray talked to brother Frederick. John asks if he was scared. Ray says that Frederick is not so scary, but on the contrary, even cute. He says he just wanted to have tea with his brother Frederick, so Jean and John can join. John says he refuses, Jean, therefore, too. Ray says that Frederick actually loves his younger brothers very much, so they can talk to him and understand that he is cute. Raymond says he won't be offended if Jean and John refuse, but if he changes his mind, they should definitely come. Jean laughs and says they can't refuse when Ray makes such a cute face. John says he wouldn't say he doesn't like brother Frederick, but since Ray is asking, he'll try to come. Raymond smiles, because they have agreed, and then he tells them to definitely come. A few days later, Maria comes into Raymond's room and says that an invitation to tea has come from Mr. Frederick. Ray says that since he is participating, he needs to bring a souvenir, so he asks Maria to prepare something. The girl agrees. Then Chris comes to Raymond. Ray thanks him for going with him today. Raymond thinks that Master Chris turned 30 this year, and Maria is already 24 years old. He thinks it's time for the two of them to get married and then have nice kids. Raymond doesn't want Maria to get any man, and Master Chris has to marry the best woman. Suddenly Brother Bertrand comes into Raymond's room and asks where he is going. This is unusual, because Ray most often spends time only with him, John and Jean. Ray says he's having tea with his brother Frederick today. Bertrand asks if he can go too. Ray agrees. Maria comes back and says she can't find any sweets. Ray says they can't go empty-handed, and Bertrand drags Raymond along and says it's time for them to go. Bernardo greets them and also greets Mr. Bertrand. Bertrand says they haven't seen Bernardo for a long time. Suddenly Bernardo says that Mr. Andre will also come today. Bertrand is surprised with disgust. Ray asks what's the matter. Bernardo says they have a little family problems. Bertrand asks Bernardo not to call them family, because he does not want to have anything to do with Andre. Suddenly Andre comes into the room and greets Raymond, saying that they are talking for the first time. Raymond sees Andre and thinks that he is one of his brothers and the third prince of the kingdom, Andre Santoro. Ray asks his brother if he also decided to come to the tea party. The young man says that he is very glad to meet and holds out his hand to him. Suddenly, Bertrand grabs Raymond and tells Andre not to touch him. Andre frowns sharply. Andre was indignant and asked his brother what the problem was. Bertrand said that Andre had already spoiled his older brother too much and therefore he was too relaxed. Raymond began to get upset and angry, because he did not understand why his brothers were fighting with each other so much. Raymond turned to Frederick and wished him good morning. He said that Bertrand and Andre have a really bad relationship. Frederick said he didn't hate each other, but they were constantly fighting over him. Raymond tried to find out why the brothers were quarreling over Frederick, but he was interrupted by their screams. Andre said that he just wanted to help brother Frederick, and Bertrand said that it means not only in negotiations, but Andre also pokes his nose into his personal affairs. Andre said that he just wanted to help, and in negotiations he helps Frederick only when he himself can't find the words. He also says that Bertrand is too strict with Frederick. Bertrand knows perfectly well that Frederick has no tongue at all. If this continues and Andre does everything for him, then Frederick will never learn how to talk to people. Frederick sighed and told Raymond that he was very bad in attitude, even though he was the crown prince, so Bertrand and Andre were helping him. Ray says it's like they're arguing about how to raise a child. Raymond breaks down and shouts to his brothers to stop quarreling. Bertrand and Andre immediately fell silent and froze, looking at Raymond. The young man pointed his finger at Bertrand and said that he really went with him to stand here and argue with brother Andre. 
Bertrand replied so that Raymond would understand that Frederick is the crown prince, but he cannot without the necessary skills, and all because of communication with this specialist Andre. Raymond told Bertrand to listen, and then stated that everyone has their own pace of communication. Andre laughed, but Raymond turned around and said that now it would be his turn. He turned to Andre and said that he understood that he was worried about his brother Frederick, but he was already quite an adult and an independent person, so if he left him alone, Frederick would learn to speak by himself. Andre can't take care of him forever. Raymond turns around and says it's finally brother Frederick's turn. Frederick was full of determination. Ray asked why he was so cheerful. Frederick said it was the first time he had seen Raymond so angry, so he wanted to hear what he had to say. Raymond suggests everyone start drinking tea. After a while, dessert was brought out and Ray said that Maria had prepared a very beautiful meal. Frederick replied that it seemed that these dishes were popular in the Ost Empire, and he always wanted to try them. Frederick then asks Raymond about what he wanted to get into the academy, and then asks what he planned to study there. The Centauro Academy has many faculties. There is a faculty of magic among them, and Brother Bertrand teaches there. Raymond says he's been thinking about it. Bertrand asks if Raymond didn't want to enter the faculty of magic. Ray replies that he can learn magic from Brother Bertrand, so he thought of enrolling in the Faculty of Knights. Frederick thought that, as Raymond said, he had decided to leave. Suddenly, everyone fell silent at once. Andre and Bertrand, in a panic, ask Raymond if he is joking, saying that he wants to leave the royal family. Bertrand asks his brother where he is going to go. Raymond said he wasn't sure he was going to the city yet. He's not going anywhere until he sees her fiancé. And until Master Chris finds himself a worthy bride, he can't even be forced to leave here. Andre asks Raymond that if Maria never marries, then Ray will stay in the royal palace forever. Ray with a cold look told Andre not to even think about destroying Maria's happy family life because of such a trifle. He threatens him to just try to do it and Ray will never forgive him for it. In any case, he won't give it to the first person he sees. It should be a strong and responsible man, ready for trials. Bernardo said that Ray really cares about Maria. Raymond says it's natural, because Maria is like an older sister to him. The girl begins to sob with happiness. Frederick turns to Maria and says that she is from the Duke's family, and then asks if she has a fiancé. The girl replied that she rejects everyone until His Highness Raymond grows up. Ray realized that because of him, she missed the marriageable age. Raymond dismisses his thoughts and tells Frederick that if he continues, Ray will get very angry. If he is going to betroth him to Maria, then he will never drink tea with him again. Frederick was frightened. Bertrand says that since we are talking about marriage with Grimaldi, the future bride of Raymond from the house of Baltzer will obviously be unhappy. Raymond asks if he really has a future bride. Frederick replies that she is about the same age as him. Raymond thinks it's a problem, so it's probably best to go to the city. Bertrand tells Raymond that everything is fine. He roughly understands what Ray is thinking right now. No matter what happens, he shouldn't worry, because his brothers will protect him. Andre says that he is worried not only about this wayward Frederick, he is even ready to cooperate with Bertrand, so he tells Raymond not to be afraid, because they will always be there. Bernardo said that his mother Maya's faction currently dominates. She is followed by the faction of Karina, Frederick's mother. Maya's aristocrats want to raise Raymond to the top, and Karina's aristocrats want to make Raymond their pawn. Raymond said that, in other words, his mom is just a decoration. Bertrand says that Ray took and without hesitation called his own mother a decoration. Andre says that they don't talk about it at all, and now we need to go back to the academy. But why does Raymond want to choose the knight's faculty? The magic faculty of this harmful Bertrand will obviously be more decent. But for some reason the young man wants to become a knight. Raymond said that since Andre asked, he wanted to be like Master Chris. Chris shudders and asks for forgiveness. Andre asks where such admiration comes from. Raymond says that even when he was a little kid, he treated him like a real gentleman, so there's no reason not to admire Chris. He imagines Chris telling him that he has become stronger, and then asking how about this attack and whether Ray can withstand it. Then he imagines how he will barely stand on his feet and hold the sword with his last strength. Chris will come up and tell him that it's not over yet, and then hold out his hand. Frederick says Raymond likes Chris very much. Ray says he just adores him. He is a real, reliable gentleman. He has such steel muscles, like a real man. He falls on his knees to make eye contact with Ray. He is not afraid to get them dirty. He always asks permission when he picks him up, and if necessary, he is ready to release his inner child. Chris was just amazed. Ray asks everyone to look at him, and then says that how can you be so cute and cool at the same time? Frederick asks Chris to look after Raymond. The man says that his highness Frederick can rely on him. 
Frederick says that the younger brother does not admire any of his brothers. His idol is the swordsman Chris. Bertrand says it can't be helped. He supported and was close to Ray, even when they were not familiar. Andre says that because of the division into factions, he could not talk to Raymond. Ray says Andre will now be able to talk to him whenever he wants. Andre smiles and hugs his younger brother, saying that this is their contract. Then another prince comes into the room and says that Bert and On are also here. It was Orlando. The man admires that Raymond is also here. Raymond greets his brother and says that they can talk for the first time. The fourth prince Orlando Centoro. He studied abroad in the kingdom of Ockidens. He fell in love with the princess of that kingdom at first sight and got engaged to her. Orlando and Frederick have the same mother, but they are very different. Orladno tells Riamadon that he lives with Fran, and Fran is his wife. He also says that he has wanted to talk to his younger brother for a very long time. Raymond asks if Orlando really lives in Ockidens. Orlando says that after he and graduated from the academy, he went abroad to Ockidens. Frederick tells Orlando to stop calling him that, but the man replies that he is already used to it. Orlando says On used to look like a girl. Bertrand says Andre really used to be too nice. Andre says Bertrand is only a year older than him, and he acts like he's a lot older, but Bertrand says he's really older. Andre doesn't consider him his big brother. Orlando says that Andre and Bertrand are like the whole top of the head. Frederick speaks to Orlando and asks how Mrs. Fran is doing. Orlando blushes and says if Frederick really wants to talk about Fran, he says Fran is very nice. If he talks to another girl, Fran starts to get very jealous and sulky, but this only makes her nicer. Then he puts his arm around her from behind. She puts her hand on Orlando's arm and calms down, and is also mildly embarrassed. Fran always wears peach or gold dresses to the ball. He asks if they know why. Raymond replies that this is in order to match Orlando's hair color. Andre bursts into the conversation and asks Frederick to stop playing along and says that he does not need to be listened to at all because he broke through as always. Then the young man realizes that chaos has reigned in the room. He asks Frederick if he can go home, but Frederick asks him to stay, because without him everything will get completely out of control. Raymond says he doesn't think his presence will change anything. Frederick says the brothers are funny, so why not stay and laugh? Then Raymond starts yelling for everyone to stop quickly. He asks the brothers if they really came here just to quarrel or to drink tea after all. Orlando says he just wanted to ask what to give Fran. Raymond replies that he should think for himself, because the girl will be more pleased if Orlando chooses a gift for her himself. Bertrand and Andre apologize to Raymond. Andre says Bertrand annoys him anyway. Suddenly someone knocked on the door, and then Bernardo asks the guests to come in. All the brothers turn around and smile in surprise. Giancarlo and Giovanni came into the room. Jean was hiding behind his brother in embarrassment, and Jan apologized for their tardiness. Jean awkwardly said that they had heard that Raymond had gone to tea with his older brother Frederick. John said they understand it's rude to come uninvited, but he hopes the brothers won't mind if they join. Raymond immediately jumped up from his seat after his words and ran to hug Jan and John. Jean was embarrassed and asked what had come over Raymond. Raymond looked at John and said that he would hug him later. Jean said that in this case he would squeeze Raymond. John was awkwardly embarrassed and told them to hug him too, because he was waiting too. Ray hugs John, and then says that the hugging is over successfully. Raymond turns to his brothers, who were looking at their younger brother in complete shock. Bernardo said that Ray can behave like an ordinary six-year-old child. Andre also wanted Ray to hug him. Frederick said that Ray is on such good terms with Jean and John, and Bertrand said that Ray can also be affectionate. Raymond said why he can't be affectionate, because he's still an ordinary child. He says it's like Bertrand with magic. The young man says that Andre and Orlando had a normal conversation for the first time today. Usually they do not quarrel and do not notice anything around. Andre says it's hard to deny. Raymond turns to Bernardo and says that brother Frederick will be a gentle king rather than a strict king. Bertrand asked if he really appreciated Frederick that way. The kingdom is created by common forces. No matter how talented the king is, he is nobody without the people, so everyone should help him. Raymond also says that he will also help brother Frederick if he becomes king. Frederick is embarrassed and says that he has a very cool younger brother. Bernardo is happy for Raymond. The main character thanks for the praise. Raymond takes Jean and John by the hand and asks the other brothers to make room for them. Orlando was delighted and said that all seven brothers were assembled. Raymond also says he didn't expect Jean and John to come today. John said they promised to come. 
Jean turns to brother Frederick and asks him if they really could have come today. Frederick with an angry face said there was no problem. Raymond realized that he had a very scary face. He's probably just very happy that Jean talked to him. Jean began to shake with fear and asked Frederick for forgiveness. An awkward silence hung between them. Raymond was on edge and then said they were tired. He tells Frederick that only teenagers and children cannot express their feelings normally. He asks brother Frederick to say what's on his mind right. Frederick broke out in a cold sweat and then told Jean that he was not angry. He was just not very good at communication and was just learning. He asks Jean for forgiveness if he scared him. Jean, in a panic, says that Frederick has nothing to apologize for. Raymond tells Jean not to spoil Frederick. Frederick says he knows he looks very intimidating, but he wants to do everything he can to get along with Jean and John. Jean is very surprised by this. Jean says that he had no idea about it, and that's why he always avoided Frederick, but now he understands everything. John puts his hand on Jean's shoulder and says that he also avoided Frederick and did not understand anything, but now everything is different. He says that although he is not a talented magician like Brother Bertrand, he is not a skilled diplomat like Brother Andre, and he is not as energetic as Brother Orlando, so all he can do is play music. However, he wants to get along with his brothers, although he is a half-breed who can't even use magic. Frederick stops him and says that it doesn't matter at all. A child born from the marriage of a human and a non-human is no different from any other, so Jean and John are members of his family. This is the most important thing. No matter what, he will take care of them. He smiles awkwardly and tells John and Jean that they are his precious younger brothers, so he will never turn away from them. John and Jean are amazed by Frederick's speech. They start crying, and Jean says that he always wanted to be closer with all his brothers. Frederick was very surprised, but Raymond told his brother that this was his chance to comfort Jean and John. He shouts at him to hug them quickly. Frederick asks not to ask the impossible from him. But Raymond asks what is difficult about it. Raymond is very serious. Frederick puts his hands on the shoulders of Giancarlo and Giovanni and then says that he is not very good at communicating. But he wants to get to know the two of them better, so he asks if they don't mind visiting him from time to time. Jean happily agrees, and they rush to Frederick with the words that he should not worry, because they will definitely come. Jean then wipes away his tears and apologizes, saying that he has calmed down now. John covers his face with his hands and says that he also asks for forgiveness, because he is very ashamed that he showed himself in such a way. Andre says there's nothing in it, because the young man looks pretty cute. They usually didn't approach them at all. Raymond says don't tease them. Orlando says he's so glad, because he used to think that only Ray was so cute. But it turned out that he wasn't the only one. Jean says that Orlando's brother is bullying them. Bertrand says that now the factions are not taking active actions, as during the isolation of Maya. It's not like those times when they were stuck in the middle of a faction fight. The power of Maya's aristocrats plummeted when Maya and their father started communicating again. At the moment, they can, at best, offer a potential bride so that a new prince appears. In addition, they are suppressed by the aristocrats of Karina. Therefore, he asks the younger brothers not to embarrass and rely on the older ones. Frederick asks Jean about his age and says he is 11 years old, and then asks John if he really didn't go to high school. John said he didn't know how to use magic or fence, so his father gave him music lessons. Last year, Jean had health problems, so he did not go to school. As a rule, they enter secondary school at the age of 14. Although the minimum age required for admission is 12 years, there is no upper limit, so John will still be able to enroll. But there are many who do not enter the academy, but find a personal teacher. Andre asks what about Jean? Jean said that until his health gets better, he is not going to enter the academy. Then the brothers say that the main problem today is going out into society and finding wives for Jean and Raymond. This is the problem of all three suitors, including Giovanni. Bernardo asks if Raymond doesn't have a fiancé. Andre replies that his father is not completely sure yet, especially since the aristocrats of Maya's faction will not just leave it like that. Bertrand says it's obvious that members of Maya's aristocracy will try to marry Raymond. Perhaps they will try to connect with Ray, Giovanni and Giancarlo even more tightly. Raymond says he wants to leave. There was silence in the room again, and then the brothers started asking if Ray really wanted to leave. At this time, the man was telling a girl named Leandra that she was already engaged to his highness, so the fate of the Baltzer family depends on her. The girl called the man her father and said that she understood this. The girl stood at the window and prayed. She looked up at the sky and asked Mr. Raymond what he was like. A few days later, Jean was painting a portrait of Raymond and asked him if he was really going to leave the house. Raymond answered in the negative, but muttered under his breath that it was probably. Jean asked if it was really. 
Ray replied that everything was fine and he wasn't going anywhere. Raymond says that if he decides to leave the house, he will lose his right to the throne. He will not lose his last name and will remain a family member. So there is no need to be nervous and nothing terrible will happen. Jean starts screaming and asks Raymond not to talk like that because he won't allow it. He wants to support Raymond always because he is a dear member of his family and he wants Raymond to be happy. He may not be able to do the same for Raymond as the other older brothers, but still he doesn't want him to have to sacrifice anything. This is his selfish desire. He wants to draw Raymond's baby someday. Raymond thinks that Jean is so upset, although leaving the family is a last resort. In other words, unless he has another opportunity to avoid conflicts in the royal palace. To put it bluntly, it's very troublesome, and Ray doesn't think he can handle everything on his own. Except for one thing, his memories of his previous life, everything is pretty mundane. He says that Maya's faction may also pay attention to Jean. He asks his brother to be careful with his social debut next month. He asks if Jean really doesn't want to upset his brother. Jean gives a positive answer. He asks if Ray really loves him. If so, he definitely doesn't want to upset him. He also asks what's the point if you won't be happy. Otherwise, John and his mom will also be very upset. He asks Raymond if he loves his family very much, and then says that he also madly loves everyone as a member of his family. Raymond falls to the ground and says that he has the most beautiful older brother. Jean says he has the best little brother. John appears among the trees and says that, it turns out, both of his younger brothers are the best in the world. Andre and Frederick sent him. They decided to please their father and sew a new suit for Jean. Andre is very enthusiastic about fashion design. John asked Jean if he would mind going right now, because his father had already called the seamstress. Jean says he doesn't mind, and then says goodbye to Raymond and says they'll have another chat sometime. John then asks if Raymond is serious about leaving the house. He says that as soon as Ray turns 14, he won't have to worry, because at that age he will go to study at the academy. He says it's much safer than staying in the palace. Raymond says that the problem is in the hair and eyes. I would not really like to stand out with the black hair color in the Ost Empire and the green eyes of the Centauro. John says that this black color cannot be hidden with powder paint. Raymond asks if making his hair gray will make him stand out. The hero understands that it is necessary to reduce the amount of melanin in the hair, so he decides to use weakening magic. His hair successfully turns white and so no one will recognize him for sure. Raymond turns to John and asks what he thinks. John was trembling all over and did not understand what was happening and why Raymond's hair had turned white. John started screaming that Raymond's hair had turned white. He said he had such beautiful hair. He asked if Ray could bring them back. After a moment, Raymond adds melanin to his hair and it turns dark again. John started stroking Raymond's head and said he liked this color better. Raymond says there is something to think about, namely the wedding. Ray said John didn't seem to want to get married. If he doesn't get into the academy, he won't run away. John said that there was no need to worry about it, because in fact, for some time in the United Kingdom, in the homeland of his mother, he was going to study music. Raymond is surprised and says that this is the first time he has heard about it. He asks if the young man will go there with Jean. John replies that Jean has his own hobbies. Raymond asks if John can break up with Jean. But the young man replies that this does not mean that he will not see him again. He can return to Centauro whenever he wants. His house is not going anywhere. Raymond thought that John would not want to leave Jean, so he would never leave the palace. But like everyone else, John wants to move forward. Ray says he has very cool brothers. John tells Raymond that when he studies at the academy and he has the opportunity to go abroad, he can come visit him. Ray said he would definitely do it. John smiles and says that he will wait for Raymond's arrival in the City of Elves. The older brothers congratulated Giancarlo on his first appearance. Andre boasted that he really had great taste in clothes. Bertrand said that he was forced to recognize Andre's talent, and Andre said that it was all for the sake of his dear little brother. Frederick said he was relying on him when Raymond's turn came. Meanwhile, Ray was sitting in his room by the window. He wasn't old enough to go out in public yet, so today he's sitting in his room. Maria, who was standing in the room, asked the gentleman if he needed something to drink. The young man gave a positive answer. He sat by the window and thought that Jean must be having a lot of fun right now. Suddenly someone knocked on the door of Raymond's room. The young man was scared. If it was a member of the royal family or a vassal, then he had to ask if it was possible to enter the room. He wondered who might be knocking here, for example, an outsider who got lost in the inner part of the palace. He carefully slides down from the windowsill and quietly opens the door. There was a little girl in the hallway who was crying. She was calling her father and apparently she got lost. Raymond approaches her and asks if she is lost. 
The girl screamed in fright. Raymond realized that they were about the same age, but that she had forgotten so far from the main hall. He decides to ask her if everything is fine and maybe she is lost. He says that everyone should be at the party now, and he is in the other direction. The girl noticed his sparkling eyes. The girl suddenly screamed. Ray asked what was the matter. The girl said he had black hair and green eyes. She asked if the young man was Mr. Raymond. The hero responded positively and said that they were seeing each other for the first time. He said his name was Raymond. The girl started to panic. Suddenly Maria appeared next to them. She asked Raymond what was the matter. The hero said that the girl was lost and she needed to be taken to the main hall. They enter the room. Raymond says she should rest and then they'll see her off. He also says that she must have been very scared, so she needs to pour tea too. Raymond told the girl that he will now prepare and return, so he asks her to wait here. The girl gives a positive answer. Raymond gets dressed in his room and thinks that since he's going there, he needs to look the part. So he pulls his hair behind his ears and his bright green eyes start to stand out. He comes into the room and asks the girl if she has calmed down. Maria asks her if she wants to introduce herself. The girl curtsies and says that she is from the house of Duke Baltzar, and her name is Lindra Baltzar. She is glad to meet Mr. Raymond. The young man says that he is glad to meet her. He asks permission to escort her to the main hall. Maria asks who the lady came with today. The girl says that she came with her father, Duke Baltzar, but she never met him. Her father came here because of work, so she planned to leave before the party started. But the king ordered her to eat sweets. Raymond realizes that her father, Baltzar, is a general. They say he took over his fencing skills from his predecessor. Raymond's father is very close to General Baltzar. By the way, one of his brothers said that Lindra is one of the candidates for Raymond's bride. He asks why the girl was walking here alone. Because his room is far from the main hall. Lindra made Raymond promise that he wouldn't laugh. From the window she saw a beautiful garden, so she went out to get a closer look at it and thus got lost. Raymond grins and says it's very cute. He thinks it's so childish. Lindra blushes very much at Raymond's smile. Then Raymond asks the girl what kind of garden she saw. Lindra didn't understand the question, but Raymond said there were only five gardens in the palace. Lindra said she didn't know. Raymond suggests that since this is the garden that was visible from the main hall, it means the central garden. He says that the girl went and didn't give up because she liked him so much. Lindra said he was very handsome. Raymond said there were a lot of other gardens to look at, so he would show them to her next time. Lindra grabs Raymond's hand and apologizes if her words seem very rude to him, but she asks if the young man will spend the evening with her. Raymond smiles, but apologizes to the girl. She is very scared of this answer and says that it was worth expecting. Raymond realizes that Lindra's father, General Baltzar, belongs to Karina's faction and supports Frederick as crown prince. In other words, intimacy with her will generate gossip that Raymond has joined Karina's faction, and this is unacceptable. However, he feels Maria glaring at him, because you can't make a lady cry. Suddenly someone shouts at Lindra from the side. Her father Baltzar and Chris fled there. The man said he was very worried about her. Lindra was glad to see her father and said that she was lost, and his highness Raymond escorted her here. The man looks at the young man. Raymond thought he wanted to get away before he was noticed. The young man says that he was very surprised when Mrs. Lindra knocked on his room. He looked menacingly and said that he thought that someone from this party wanted to meet him secretly. Baltzar was frightened by this sight of the young man. Raymond smiled and said he was joking. Baltzar tusks and says that the young man turned out to be much wittier than he had heard. Come to think of it, this is the first time he sees Mr. Raymond in person. He really has the black hair of the Ost Empire and the green eyes of the Centauro Kingdom. He says it's no wonder there are people in the royal palace who want to put Prince Raymond on the throne. The young man says that he likes it because the hair color belongs to his mother and the eye color belongs to his father. Baltzar said that these colors suit him. Raymond said he was often told about it. Baltzar asked who he was talking about. Raymond said that it's so interesting for a man, but it's a secret. He is not going to share secrets with people with whom he does not have a good relationship. Baltzar replies that it hurts him to hear this, and in his head he thinks with whom Raymond is on good terms. He thinks he's with Maya's faction and is planning something behind the scenes. Raymond guesses what Baltzar is thinking and approves of him continuing to screw himself up. Maria looked at the whole scene and wondered why Raymond was provoking Baltzar. Raymond smiles and asks Baltzar if he doesn't want to pry into other people's affairs, because secrets can't be revealed. If he tells too much, then the factions of Karina and Maya will focus on trying to find out what is near him, but they still won't find it. Suddenly Lindra calls Raymond. The young man asks her what's the matter. 
The girl can't stand it and asks if the young man wants to get engaged to her. Leandra's father was in shock. Raymond did not understand what was happening, and Chris and Maria blushed with surprise. Balthazar beamed with joy, and then asked his daughter if she really liked Prince Raymond. The girl gave a positive answer. She said that she did not know that she would get lost and get into Raymond's room, because it would be very rude of her. But Mr. Raymond never accused her. He behaved like a gentleman and escorted her to the place of celebration, so he wants to marry Mr. Raymond. Raymond was surprised by this. Balthazar grinned and thought, that's very good. He asked what Raymond would say. He tells him that his daughter is extremely intelligent, so does the young man want to marry her. Raymond irritably thinks that Balthazar wanted Raymond to get engaged to Lindra from the very beginning. He is also frightened by the look with which Maria drills him. The young man takes her hand and asks for forgiveness from Mrs. Lindra, but he cannot become her fiancé. The young man turns on the whiny mode and says that the problem is not with the girl, but that if she is with him, he will only interfere with her. Lindra says that if the young man is with her, he will not interfere with her. Raymond pulls her hand away and says that no way, because no one wants to mess with him. The girl starts crying. Raymond says that if, when they grow up, she still loves him, then let her say these words to him again. Something he wants to say now is that, after all, he is a man, so when he grows up, he will become stronger to protect her. The girl started crying and said she would wait. She says she can protect him too. Raymond thinks that Lindra is a special girl and he is not worthy of her. The young man waves and says goodbye to Lindra and General Balthazar. Chris says he will see Maria and His Highness Raymond off. Maria turns to the young man and asks if he is sure. Raymond asks what the girl is talking about. Maria said she was talking about Mrs. Lindra. General Balthazar is the head of the aristocrats of Karina's faction. Raymond could have asked for protection from this faction. Ramon says he can't do it. He says they should take the bait and focus their attention on him. Maria and Chris are surprised. The man asks why Raymond says that. Raymond turns around and says he has to protect brother Jean. At this time, John went out to his brother Jean, who was standing on the balcony and breathing fresh air. John asked his brother if he was tired, but Jean gave a negative answer and said that everything was fine. Thanks to Raymond's support, he is fresh and kind. He should be the inflexible sixth prince. John said Jean was great. Jean is wondering what to do with Raymond right now. Jean is looking forward to the day when he, too, will go out into the world. Maria asked what Ray meant by protecting Mr. Jancrolo. Raymond says that now they will believe that Ray is the only one who can remove Frederick from the crown prince's place. However, assuming that Raymond joins Karina's faction or leaves the royal palace, then the aristocrats of Maya's faction will be looking for a replacement for him. That's why the next target will be Jean with the highest magic power among the brothers. They didn't touch him because he was sick, but now that he's recovered, Ray is sure they won't leave him alone. Compared to him, who has memories of a past life, Jean is an ordinary child. Adults use it for their own purposes. Therefore, Raymond will become a bait that will distract attention from Jean. The main thing is to escape later yourself. However, then the young man will go to the academy, and there he will change his appearance. At the academy, he will learn a lot and meet a lot of new people, and then there will be training, magic and fencing. He will have friends equal to him, which he will not be able to get here. Outside the walls of the palace, he will discover a new world. Until then, he intends to protect Jean at all costs. Maria is worried about the future of Mr. Raymond. Chris comes forward and says that then he will become a shield that will protect him in all adversity. Raymond says there's no way he's going to let that happen. He says that Chris is an honorary aristocrat of the kingdom, and he wants to become an ally of Raymond. Chris started out as an ordinary commoner adventurer, but then he became one of the few S-rank adventurers. Now he is as powerful as the Dukes. If such a person is with Raymond when he grows up, then the rumors that he wants to remove Frederick from the crown prince's place will begin to seem real. Chris will be considered as a participant in the competition for the throne. Chris says that he will improve his skills to become a worthy defender of Raymond and Maria. Raymond says he doesn't want Chris to become his shield. Chris asks if Raymond wants him to be his sword. Raymond says he doesn't need a sword or a shield. Because of this, Chris will only be in danger. He shouts that he would rather die alone than drag him along. Raymond says he doesn't want Chris to die for him, but he wants Chris to live for him. Raymond sets Chris a condition that only under this condition he can become his sword. Chris says they have a deal. However, since Raymond called him a sword, isn't it obvious that he should always be there? Raymond is outraged. He says that if he gets stuck and doesn't know what to do next, then Chris will become his sword and show the way. And only in this case they will be ready to give their lives together. Chris says it's mandatory. Raymond says that if Chris sacrifices his life just like that, 
He will hate him, so no amateur activity. Maria watched them and realized that she was completely useless. Unlike Mr. Chris, she cannot become either a shield or a sword. She can't be of any use to him. Raymond turns to the girl and then takes her hands. He says that the girl is like a mother to him, as an older sister and as a teacher, so if he finds himself in a difficult situation in the future, the girl shouldn't think she can't do anything. Everything he has now is thanks to Maria. When he was just born, the first hands that took the hero were Maria's hands. She was the one who told her everything about the world. She was with him in a room in which there was absolutely nothing. She brought him out of the steels pressing on him, as well as Master Chris, Jean and John and the rest of his brothers, they are all dear people of Raymond. He tells the girl that he became like this only because of her. The girl says that from the bottom of her heart she is glad that she was able to raise Raymond. The girl says that she will not be able to protect him like Mr. Chris, she will not be able to become his right hand or cover him from behind. Perhaps when he grows up, he will have his own place, his home, where he will return, and he will no longer need her. However, the girl will protect the honor of Mr. Raymond. If he goes astray, he will do everything possible to stop him. If the whole world is against him, then she will be the one who will shout the loudest about his innocence. After all, it is her duty as his first teacher. Raymond said she was the best girl. After a while, John was saying goodbye to Raymond and Jean. Jean was drinking tea and asked Raymond about John, who had gone to notes. Raymond asked if Jean would be bored. Jean replied that he already spent all his time with John, so he doubted that he would miss him even a little. Raymond said it was cruel and suggested what would have happened if brother John had heard it. Jean asked not to take it seriously, because he was joking. Jean laughs and says that John tried to seem so cool, especially in front of Raymond. The hero replies that this is the first time he has heard this, but if you think about it, John is really very cool, but he seems nice. Then Raymond asks where brother Jean is going. He says there is no point in hiding it because Jean is also going to leave the palace. Jean smiled and said that nothing could be hidden from Raymond. Raymond asks if he is so predictable. Jean said that he just talked to Ray most often, so it's obvious that he began to understand him. Then Ray asked where he was going. Jean smiles and says he doesn't care where he goes. Jean said that Ray was going to leave the family because he had the same idea. Raymond said that although he would go to the academy, Jean says that Ray, as always, is so quick-witted, so he will wait for his appearance in public, and then they will look. Ray said he'd be 17 by then. Jean said he didn't have that much time. Ray thinks that Jean is not a fool at all. He understands that he is essentially hiding behind his younger brother. He also has a vague understanding of how his presence affects his future. Raymond asks what Jean will do with the color of the eyes, because the green color of the royal family's eyes stands out a lot. Jean said he would become a blind artist. Raymond said there was no need to become one. Raymond said Jean couldn't leave the palace and keep his eyes closed forever. Jean said that he knows, so even with his eyes closed, he will be able to see everything around with the help of magic. Ray said it sounded cool, and Jean thanked him. Jam asked Ray that he wanted to enter the Faculty of Knights. A group of students also gathers at the Academy. The Academy has a group system. The group consists of five students. Together, they try to put their knowledge into practice. Jean says he doesn't know how to fight at all. If he decides to go on a trip, he will request an escort at the academy. So if Raymond forms his own group, then he can take on an escort. Raymond says he has no problem helping, but then he asks why he is the one. Jean says that if Ray accompanies him, they will go to John's in the notes. He asks if Ray wants to see John surprised. Raymond is surprised and says he agrees. A few days later, Maria came with a bunch of letters that were invitations to tea parties. Raymond thought that all the factions were even more interested in him. After his meeting with General Baltzar, the aristocrats seem to have gone mad. Everyone is trying to contact him. He says there are so many problems from adults and then tears up the letters. Maria announces that Mr. Chris has come. Chris comes into the room and says that a lot of people have been walking along the East Corridor lately. He asks him to be careful and not stay alone in his room. Raymond said everything was fine. He asked if Chris had a task. Chris gives a positive answer and says that it seems there is someone in the army who wants to keep him away from Raymond's room. He will return as soon as he completes the task. Raymond sadly tells him to be careful and not let himself get hurt. Chris is angry and says that he will not allow his master to be alone for a long time with those who are trying to use him for their own purposes. He angrily asks his highness to rely on him. Ray gets scared and then is left alone and goes to the window. He turns to Maria and asks if he was mistaken. Chris has become his sword, has become his protector, so he wonders if he should have said all this then. He just wanted a normal life with his family because all this politics and power struggle is very tiring and he doesn't want it. 
He asks Maria if he can handle it all. Maria says that she does not understand all these complicated things, but she is glad that Raymond decided to share his experiences with her. If he hadn't told her that, then surely she would have wept from her helplessness when he needed help. Neither she nor Mr. Chris understood all the horrors of the struggle for power. Raymond says that if someone else had been in his place, he would have come up with a better plan. The girl says it's possible, but nothing comes to her mind at all. She understands how Chris is feeling right now. He is very angry, as she is, that they had no idea about anything and Raymond had to make such a decision alone. Mr. Chris now understands what a heavy burden Ray has taken on himself. He can only blame himself and regret, so she asks him to wait for the gentleman a little. They need time to get rid of the habit of blaming themselves. Raymond thinks that maybe he needs time to finally sort out his emotions. The young man thanks Maria. Then a young man bursts into the room and screams for forgiveness. He says he's here to guard His Highness Raymond, instead of Mr. Chris. The young man's name is Kajimo Bossa. Raymond didn't understand what the young man meant. Kajimo says he will take over Chris' duties while he is away. He says he's glad to meet you. But suddenly Maria appears between him and Raymond. Kajimo asks the girl if he remembers correctly that her name is Maria. He says he's looking forward to working with them. Maria says Kajimo is the son of Count Boss. Maria says that although he does not serve her Grimaldi family, but she will not allow an imposing attitude. The girl introduces herself as the Duke's daughter. Kajimo grins and asks to forgive his rudeness. The young man sits down on his knee and kisses the back of the girl's hand. He calls Maria mistress. The girl was stunned in shock. Kajimo asks if he can talk to his highness. Maria says that does the young man really think that he will allow him to communicate with Prince Raymond without the knowledge of minimal politeness? She asks the young man to leave immediately. Kajimo apologizes. He says he was just very nervous, as this is the first time he is guarding a royal person. But from now on he will be treated extremely politely, so Maria should allow him to introduce himself to his highness. Raymond turns to Maria and tells her to contact General Baltzar right away. He must be responsible for changing his guards, so they can discuss this matter with him. Maria said she understood Raymond. He takes the sword in his hands and says that for now he will get rid of this hindrance with his own hands, which hinders Maria. Kajimo, in a panic, asks to discuss all this. Raymond says he's finally out of the way. He suggests that Maria go and inform the general. The man stops Raymond and says that he will leave the room, but if the young man leaves the room, the local nobles immediately pull their hands to him. Chris told him that the young man should never go out. Maria said Kajimo was rude. Raymond said he didn't want people like Kajimo touching a girl, much less kissing her hand. Maria does not want such people to guard her master. Raymond turns to Maria and asks her to promise that if he is forced to give up or lose, the girl should leave him. If the girl is happy, then Ray will be happy too. Maria was very touched. At this time, Leandra wished her father good night. Her father wishes her good night, too. Baltzar closes the door, but the young man next to him says that he has returned. Baltzar asked about His Highness Raymond. The young man says that he is very careful with those around him. Even today, he did not allow even an aristocrat of the Maya faction to approach. His Highness is being cared for by the daughter of the Grimaldi family. She must have a very strong influence on him. There is nothing interesting in the letters. His Highness does not associate with other aristocrats in any way. Baltzar is talking about the Grimaldi family. This family has declared neutrality since Raymond was born. It is no exaggeration to say that the victory or defeat in the struggle of the faction will depend on who they decide to join. The influence of Grimaldi from Maria. The origin of Centauro and Austin Waymond. The power of the swordsman Yarkos from Chris. Baltzar is trying to figure out what Prince Raymond is up to. He even suggested that Raymond was going to get rid of all his brothers and take over the throne. He orders the young man to continue watching Raymond, but very carefully. Then Baltzar wanted to address the young man, but said that it was probably better to address him not by his native surname. He calls him Rashid Herzen. He talks about the boss's prodigal son and says he will show what he is capable of. At this time, Maria was standing in front of Raymond's room, but suddenly someone clamped a handkerchief over her mouth. The unknown said that he had found his dear Maria. The girl fell unconscious. The story happened shortly before the release of Giancarlo. Bertrand was indignant and said that how much more Andre was going to sew. Giancarlo is not his doll, so that's enough. Andre said that his beloved younger brother has an important day, so he wants to sew the best outfit. Orlando said that they still can't choose an outfit, and they scare Jean, so he offers everyone to live together. Bertrand says that he tolerates Andre in general only because of Giancarlo. Andre asks him not to get involved and says that he is already making the last adjustments to the costume. Orladno says to Jean that Bertrand and Andre are so caring, 
but they still can't agree. Jean asks why they hate each other so much. Orlando says it's nothing like that. When Anna has any problems, he immediately runs to Bertrand, because he always trusts him and has been for a very long time. Even as a child, Andre constantly came to Bertrand, even for such a trifle as a wounded bear. Bertrand could even fix a teddy bear with magic. Andre was very happy when his brother helped him. Bertrand wakes up and says that he had a very nostalgic dream. Suddenly Andre comes into the room and, bowing, says that he has a request. He says he wants to pack Jean's outfit beautifully, but he can't do it himself. He asks Bertrand to adjust the size of the gift with his magic. The young man says he will try it, but in the meantime Andre can come into the room. After a while, with the help of magic, Bertrand packs a gift. Andre says he looks perfect now and then thanks his brother. Bertrand pats him on the head and says that Andre has not changed at all. Andre says that maybe he has given up, but this does not mean that Bertrand can touch him. Bertrand asks not to shout to Andre, because it's too late. The next day, Jean tried on his suit and said that it was very beautiful, and the size fit perfectly. He thanks brother Andre for this gift. In this way, an outfit was sewn for Jean. Raymond hugged his brother and said that this outfit really suits him. Jean thanked Raymond. Kajimo bursts into the room and wishes good morning to his highness and Lady Maria. However, he sees the darkness in the room and abruptly comes into a little shock. Kajimo feels a strange atmosphere, and then realizes that usually at this time Maria wakes up Raymond. Then he hears some rustling in the bed. He pulls out his sword, and then abruptly pulls off the blanket and points his sword at Raymond. He understands that his highness Raymond is in front of him. Kajimo then sheaths the sword and apologizes, saying that the atmosphere in the room was different and he decided to get the sword. He asked what had happened and where Mrs. Maria was. Raymond said Maria didn't come. Seven years. Ever since Raymond was born, Maria has always come. She never left him alone. Maria is now at the age to go out with friends or start a family. However, Maria chose Raymond anyway. She couldn't go on vacation without warning. Raymond suggests that Maria may have been abducted. He turns to the boss and asks if he will do him a favor. He offers to unite to find Maria. Kajimo asks Raymond to wait. He asks why he thought Maria had been kidnapped. Kajimo assumes she's just running late. The young man grabs the boss by the face. He thinks that Maria devoted seven years of her life to him and got into trouble because of him. He had to protect her no matter what. He looks menacingly into Kajimo's face and says that this is not a request. He orders him. Kajimo must answer that he will carry out any order of his master. He asks if Kajimo understood him. He looks at the young man with his cruel and cold eyes, and then asks the young man's answer. Kajimo was seriously scared. He sits down on his knees and repeats Raymond's words. The young man says that since Kajimo understood, he goes immediately to General Baltzar, and will tell him about the situation. The way he will bring back Master Chris. He thinks he doesn't need to say, but Chris also cares about Maria very much. It can be said that the two of them raised Raymond like real parents. Chris is furious and says that this happened because General Baltzar sent him away. He tells him to be ready to take responsibility. Kajimo noticed that Raymond was speaking too harshly to him, and perhaps he noticed that the young man was a spy. Raymond is dressed and says that he will find out how long Maria has been missing. Kajimo asks where Raymond is in such a hurry. Maria is the daughter of the Grimaldi family. If she is harmed, the Grimaldi family will act. Doesn't that guarantee her safety? They shouldn't be in a hurry. Raymond says that Kajimo seriously thinks that the kidnapper might care. Did the knights encounter only honest people? The chance of survival in a kidnapping depends only on how much time has passed. If she was abducted for the purpose of killing or fixing dirty things, then the chances are minimal at all. If he's wrong, they won't lose anything. However, it is possible that Maria was abducted to subdue Raymond. He doesn't know what happened to her, so it's natural that he's in a hurry. Kajimo says he understands, but only asks to make Raymond promise not to leave the room. Mr. Chris will come back to protect him, so he has to rely on them. Raymond says he has until the end of the day. If he can't find Maria today, then he will be the one to take up the case, so Kajimo should remember this. Raymond says that today he wanted to go to his mother, so he needs Kajimo to guard him there. Kajimo sighs and thinks that he doesn't know if he has ever felt such pressure during a normal conversation as when he was talking to His Highness Raymond. Kajimo thinks Raymond is definitely smart, but what kind of seven-year-old kid estimates the chances of survival in a kidnapping? Raymond asks Kajimo how long he will stand and orders him to hurry up. Kajimo apologizes and offers Raymond to escort him to Mrs. Maya's room. Suddenly, the young man notices that Raymond's hand is shaking all over, so he understands that he is worried. He pretends to be strong, but in fact he is afraid. Kajimo thought Raymond didn't look like a child, but it looks like he was mistaken. 
If only he had followed Mr. Gerard, he would have been able to protect him, even after his false identity, Rashid Herzen. Kajimo asks if he needs to take Raymond's hand. The young man said not to overdo it. He can only escort him today. Kajimo is annoyed, but thinks that Raymond is even cute in some ways. At this time, Maria wakes up in a room. She tries to figure out where she is and looks around the room. Then the girl remembers that she was attacked from behind. She is sure that they want to set a trap and lure Prince Raymond here. As a result, Maria realizes that she has become Raymond's weak point. His Highness won't want to just abandon him. Even if he gets hurt, the main thing is that she is safe. The girl imagines his words and thinks that he will say it for sure. Therefore, the girl understands that she must escape from here on her own. She leaves the room and tries to look around. She sees a window and thinks she can get out through it. The girl can't reach him. Suddenly someone comes up from behind and asks what the girl is trying to do. He grabs her and throws her on the bed. The girl turns around and sees Mr. Hoffer. The man smiles and says that they haven't seen Maria for a long time. Hoffer Casanelli is the current head of the Casanelli family and a leading aristocrat from the Maya faction. The girl asked how he dragged her here and why he needed her. The man replied that the girl herself understands this perfectly. He asks the girl to relax because she has already talked to her about marriage. Maria says that they have already closed this topic. She asks if the man really still intends to marry her in order to attract Prince Raymond to his side. She asks if the man really thinks that Raymond will join him seriously when he resorts to such tricks. The man replies that, of course, it is useful, but does the girl really not understand? He asks the girl if she doesn't understand what he wants from her. He orders Maria to make him happy. Raymond came to his mom Maya's room. The girl was sitting at a table. She was very happy when her son came to visit her. The girl asked her son to climb on his mother's lap. Raymond ran to hug his mom. Since the day when the gap between father and mother disappeared, the girl became just extraordinarily beautiful. Before that, she was more of a scarecrow. Maya became more emotional. The servants who used to be afraid of her now smile at her and think she's cute. Suddenly Kajimo drew attention to himself. The young man was simply puzzled. Prince Raymond is sitting on Lady Maya's lap. We urgently need to bring an artist here so that he can draw it all. Raymond said he was seven years old, so what's strange about that? And anyway, Kajimo has to do his job. Ray orders Master Chris to be brought here, because this will be the first step towards restoring his reputation in Raymond's eyes. Kajimo mumbles and says that Raymond can't be seven years old. Meyer asked if this young man was replacing Naruko's. Then Meyer asked where Maria was. The young man thinks that the girl has disappeared and he assumes that she was abducted. Raymond says the girl has a day off today. Meyer asks the maids and says if they know anything about it. One maid says that this is the first time she has heard about it, and the second suggested that Maria was ill. Raymond thought that one of her confidants might be involved, but it seems that they have nothing to do with it. He also says that Maria didn't tell him anything either. He understands what this is for the first time, and he hoped that at least her mother's servants would know something. Suddenly Maya puts her hand on the young man's head and says that she will talk about it with Abraham, because maybe he knows something about Maria. Raymond thought it would be nice if he knew something. Because of Raymond, Maria is in danger and, for sure, she now hates him. Suddenly Maya takes her son by the cheeks and says that really he does not want to rely on her. Until he opened her eyes, she couldn't even express her feelings. The girl says it's her fault. Raymond's eyes and his hair and the fact that she kept telling him to become the crown prince. Raymond says that even if it wasn't her, someone else would have told him about it too. Maya says Raymond is so kind, just like Abraham. She will try her best to protect Maria because she started it all. Raymond tells her not to overdo it. After all, he wants his mother to be happy too. The girl smiles sweetly and asks her son if he wants to become king. But Raymond says he doesn't want that one bit. He says he doesn't have the necessary qualities, but brother Frederick has them. Suddenly Meyer asks who then the young man wants to become. Raymond never thought about it. Each of the brothers is good at something. He would also like to try himself at something that no one else can do. Raymond says that, of course, it is not final, but he wants to become a traveler. He wants to tell the world. Maria told him about the world outside, so he really wants to see this world. Somewhere in the Midlands, as if the gods living in the mountains, dragons live, and there are also knights who can ride these dragons. Such stories make his heart flutter. Meyer asks if Raymond really wants to see her homeland. Every member of the imperial family in the Ost Empire has a dragon. Maya didn't have her own dragon because she was given away in marriage, but every firstborn inheriting the kingdom gets a dragon. The girl says that she will definitely show Raymond everything if they go there. Raymond says that someday he will be able to show Maria everything. Maya smiles. Maya then suggests leaving the search for Maria to General Baltzar. 
In the meantime, she suggests that the young man talk to his mother. Suddenly Chris bursts into the room. Raymond says welcome back to Chris. Chris sits on his knee and says that he heard that Maria was missing. Raymond says that according to the night's investigation, she disappeared last night. Chris hugs the prince and says that he is very glad that Ray is safe. He tells him that he won't let him go a step now. He also says that tomorrow he has to discuss Maria's disappearance with Mr. Boss. He looks at the other guards and says that he alone is enough to protect his highness and everyone else should go back to General Balthazar. One of the guards says that Mr. Balthazar ordered them to accompany Prince Raymond. Chris says that with them it will be more difficult for him to protect his highness because they only get in the way. His gaze was simply terrifying. He pokes his claw right into the neck of one of the guards and says that if you relax for even a second, you will turn out to be a corpse. Chris, with an angry face, says that he still wonders if at least one of the guards will be able to follow his movements. Then Chris smiles sweetly and tells the guys to look for Mrs. Maria. He will then join along with his highness, so they should try to gather all the necessary information. Raymonda asks if the culprit is someone from the faction. Raymond says that most likely it is, at least he says so, but it doesn't seem that any of his mother's confidants know anything at all. Her maids are all daughters of aristocrats from the Maya faction, and if something happened related to him, then it is logical that they are the first to fall under suspicion, because if their parents are up to something, then they definitely need to know something. Chris understands that, therefore, he has nothing to do with it. Raymond asks about Maria's family and asks if there is any aristocrat who can compete with the Grimaldi family. Chris says that if you think about it, the family of Queen Bernini, the military family of the Kingdom of Centoro is the Balzar family. These two families support Frederick, that is, Karina's faction, the Rover family, and also the Cassinely family, which is at the head of Maya's faction. They support Raymond as the crown prince. Raymond thinks that together with the Grimaldi family, which maintains authority, they make up the five duchies of Centoro, Cassinely in the east of the country, Grimaldi in the south, Rover in the west, Bernine in the center of the country, and Balzar are located in the north. Raymond realizes that one of them has kidnapped Maria. Bernini. Rudo knew that Raymond was going to leave the family, so most likely they would not have kidnapped Maria. General Balzar has now mobilized a lot of forces to search for her, which means he is not either. The Grimaldi family has no reason to kidnap their own daughter. This means that the kidnappers are Rover or Casinals. The next day, Chris said that they hadn't seen each other for a long time, addressing Mr. Boss. He says that it turned out that while he was away, Maria was kidnapped. He asks the trembling Kajimo boss if he wants to explain how it happened. The young man in a panic asks for mercy. Chris presses Kajimo against the wall and menacingly says that if Maria gets hurt, he will cut his thin throat. Raymond calls Chris to him. He says it's better for them to deal with the boss later because it's not time yet. Chris apologizes and lifts the young man into his arms and says that this way he is safer. Raymond thought Chris was very cool. Suddenly the man coughed and said that Raymond and Chris get along so well, but for what purpose they came to him. Raymond apologizes to General Balzar and asks about Cassinely or Rover, and also, as the man thinks, which of them could have kidnapped Maria. Balzar asks why exactly these two families. Raymond said he came to this conclusion by elimination. Grimaldi doesn't need to kidnap his own daughter, the Bernini family would have been stopped by brother Frederick, and the general's family, Balzar, they would never do such a thing. The young man grins and asks if he is really right. Balzar asks if the young man really calculated it himself. Raymond asks if Balzar is so interested in this. The man gives a positive answer. Raymond crosses his legs and tells Balzar to stop stalling and tell him who it can be from two families, and maybe he will answer this question. Balzar thought about it and says that of these two, the most likely is the Cassinely family. Raymond asked why. Balzar says it's because of the current head of the family, Hoffer Cassinely. This man took advantage of the occasion when Lady Meyer entered the Centoro family to unseat her predecessor. Balza also said that it is rumored that he only pretends to support Ms. Meyer in order not to lose his title. If anyone is capable of such a dirty act as kidnapping a woman, it's only him. Raymond turns to Chris and tells them to hurry up now because they have to save her. Chris said he was listening and then ran to the window. Balzar and Bossa looked at what was happening in shock. Balzar said it was the second floor. Raymond was ordering Chris to head to the Hoffer Cassinely estate. Chris jumped out the window. Balzar shouted at Kajimo to run after them and protect Prince Raymond. After a while, Chris asked the boss if he was okay. The young man was on all fours and trying to catch his breath. Kajimo said that not only did they jump from the second floor, they also rushed forward at great speed. He asks if Chris and Raymond realize how hard it was to keep up with them. 
Raymond said that since everything was fine, they should head to Cassinley's house. The boss asked if he was just being ignored. It's a long way to Cassinley's house. They'd better use a carriage or teleportation magic. He's certainly not good at boss magic. Chris says that, unfortunately, he is also a complete zero in magic. Raymond thinks Chris is already insanely good at fencing. If he also possessed magic, he would be generally dangerous and invincible. Bossa says that Raymond can take a carriage from the royal palace. He asks where they rush to on foot. Chris said that the prince told him to go, so he went, but he didn't think about the carriage. The boss asks to refrain from self-action. Raymond says they couldn't find Maria all day yesterday. Then Raymond asks where they are now. Chris said that outside the royal palace, where Raymond usually stays, there is a headquarters building nearby. Military units and training grounds are located on the territory of the headquarters. Now they are behind the main gate right behind the headquarters building. Raymond asks about the military units and says that Chris went through such security with him in his arms. Chris says to make sure the prince is sure they didn't even notice them. Therefore, if Raymond suddenly wants to leave the palace, then he should tell him, and he will already take him out. Kajimo said that if they did that, his job would become much more difficult. The boss says that he will go and get them a horse, so they should not go anywhere from here. He tells them not to dare to move a step from here. Chris puts a raincoat on Raymond and says that he has only just thought about it. Raymond's black hair color and green eyes will give him an air, and this stands out too much. Raymond says he needs to put on his armor. Chris says that in armor it will be uncomfortable for him to hold the prince in his arms, and they will not suit him. Raymond says Chris is incredibly cool. The man thanks for the compliment. Bossa came up with the horses and said he was watching. They were having fun here, but they seemed to be in a hurry. They began to move out. The Centauro Kingdom is located in the heart of the world, and the Royal Palace is located in the center of the Aristocrat District. The Commoners District is spread around the Aristocrats District, and they are now heading to the east of the Aristocrats District. Now Raymond is facing what he constantly saw through the window, the world beyond the Royal Palace. Chris says that the mansion is further away, but if they get closer, they may be noticed, so they will walk further. Bossa says he'll look after the horses here. He also says it's stupid to ask, but he really wants to take Maria by force. Raymond nods positively. Chris says that if something happens, he trusts Kajimo his highness, so he should be ready to run away with him immediately. If it comes to a battle, who knows how it will end. Chris looks and thinks how they can now get into the mansion. Kajimo was surprised and said that they still hadn't thought through the plan. Chris said that to be honest, he thought they would just come in and that's it. The boss said that they were going to the potential abductor of Mrs. Maria and they didn't even come up with a plan. Raymond told the man not to worry. He's not completely stupid after all. Maria was kidnapped to attract Raymond. So, it is unlikely that she will be killed, but most likely just held hostage. But if they want to harm Maria, then he will immediately surrender to them and obey, no matter how humiliating it is. So they will confirm that Maria is in the Cassinely mansion. The rest can be left to General Baltzar. Meanwhile, Raymond will be in their hands like bait. The young man turns to Chris. The man says he refuses. Raymond said he hadn't said anything yet. The man replied that he could already guess what he wanted to say. He's been looking after him since Raymond was born. The young man says that he still has to agree with him, but Chris understands perfectly well that they will not kill Raymond. Raymond says that only he can save Maria, and no matter how many guards there will be, but Maria must be a priority. While Maria is being held hostage, his hands are tied. Chris says he understands, but he's not going to give it away. They'll all come out together, the three of them. He swears he will protect them all. He asks you to believe in him and stop thinking about how Raymond is going to surrender. After a while, Raymond appears in front of the main gate. The guards did not understand what kind of child and whether he was lost. The man asks the young man if he has any business at the Cassinely mansion. The second one says that if he remains silent, they may misunderstand him. The men started laughing. Suddenly, someone grabs the second man from behind and begins to strangle him. The second man turns around. Raymond approaches him and calls him brother. He looks menacingly with his green eyes and asks not to be distracted at the post. At this moment, Chris immobilizes the man with a blow to the back of the head. Chris and Raymond are putting the guards down by the tree. Raymond asks what they should do if it turns out that the Cassinals have nothing to do with the abduction. Chris laughs and says that then he will have to tell him off for what he did here. Then they are going to go to the Cassinely mansion. Raymond knocks on the door. A voice outside the door asks who has come. Raymond asks if Mr. Hoffer is in the mansion right now. The man outside the door asks what their business is. The young man clenches his hand into a fist and says that he will continue when he is allowed inside. He asks how long he has to stand outside. 
he says with an angry look that Raymond has come to meet him. Suddenly the door opens abruptly. The man grabs Raymond by the shoulders and stammers his name. He asks if the young man is really the real Prince Raymond. The hero replies that he is quite a real Raymond. A man sees beautiful glossy black curls and green eyes like emeralds. It's really Prince Raymond in front of him. Then the man asks for forgiveness. He asks the guests to come inside and said he would take him to Mr. Hoffer. He also says Chris can come in too. The man says that Mr. Hoffer will definitely find time for Raymond and Chris. He's probably talking to Mrs. Maria right now. Raymond realizes that Maria is in this mansion after all. He suggests it could be a trap. The man says that Mrs. Maria has worked in the palace for seven years. Mr. Hoffer wanted to talk to him, so they are happy to see him here. The man asks if Raymond knows Mrs. Maria. Raymond thinks it's all weird, and then says he knows her perfectly well. The man smiles and says that if so, they will surely have a great conversation. Chris says his name is Chris Narukos, and then asks the man's name. He apologizes for his rudeness, and then says that his name is Sergno and he is Mr. Hoffer's right-hand man. Chris says the man has ash-colored hair. He assumes that the man is from the Ost Empire, the inhabitants of the Kingdom of Centoro. All have bright hair color, and the color of a man's hair is a rarity. Sergno says he was actually born in Centoro, because he was born with this hair color when he was a child. Everyone bullied him, but despite his hair color, Mr. Hoffer accepted him. Raymond thought that General Baltzar had referred to Hoffer as the ultimate scoundrel. It's possible that he just doesn't know him well. The man stopped in front of the door and said that Mr. Hoffer and Mrs. Maria were here. A long staircase led down behind the door. Raymond realized that Maria Hoffer was being held in the basement. He's clearly a villain. Chris turns to his highness and says that he will be able to stumble. He offers to carry the young man. Then they reach the right room and Sergno asks to go inside. Raymond thinks that everything will be fine with Maria. At that moment, Hoffer was asking about Raymond and when he first used magic. Maria sat there and said that Raymond was cute. His hands are soft and light as feathers or his eyes that sparkle like emeralds when he is happy. Maria says that in a word, Mr. Raymond is beautiful. Hoffer falls off his chair and starts rolling on the floor and screaming with joy. Hoffer says with tears in his eyes that Prince Raymond is the best. He asks to call an artist here to paint Raymond right now. Raymond and Chris were standing in the doorway. Maria says that she would like to return already. Hoffer didn't understand what the girl was saying. She has been with him all this time and there is no one who knows Prince Raymond better than a girl. Until she tells him everything, he won't let her go. The girl said she wanted to go home. Suddenly the girl noticed Chris and Mr. Raymond. Raymond looks at the young man who is standing next to Maria and says whether this is really Hoffer. Hoffer took power away from his predecessor. He is the current head of the Cassinely family and he kidnapped Maria to lure Raymond into a trap. So Hoffer is a terrible person. At least that's what Raymond imagined, but in fact he saw a nice man who was very embarrassed. She barely gave her name, Hoffer Cassinely. Raymond got up from his chair and walked closer to Hoffer. He asked closely why he had kidnapped Maria. The man was scared. Raymond said that he had kidnapped Maria, who was close to him, so he had to answer right away. Hoffer began to cry and said he would die happy, and then fell off the couch to the floor. Raymond didn't understand what had happened. At this time, Maria braided her hair and dressed appropriately for a maid. Raymond said he thought the girl was fine. He asked if the girl was hurt. Maria gave a negative answer. Maria says it turned out that he just wanted to find out everything about Raymond and therefore did not let her go back to the palace. Raymond asks Sergno why Hoffer is so interested in him. The man replies that the fact is that Mr. Hoffer is in love with Raymond's mother, with Mrs. Maya. Raymond sternly replied that it was impossible. Sergno said he was incapable of confessing to her. Mr. Hoffer doesn't have any self-confidence at all, so he just wants to make someone for the mistress. If it is for the sake of Lord Maya, then the Lord is ready to give his power, all his money and everything else that is possible. Raymond called him a religious fanatic. Sergno says he is loyal to Mr. Hoffer, and Mr. is loyal to Mrs. Maya and Raymond. It turns out that the whole Cassinely family and all the servants obey him implicitly. Every drop of their blood, every hair on their heads belongs to Mistress Meyer and, of course, Raymond. Raymond thinks it's like some kind of sect, like Otaku, ready to give their lives for their waifa. Raymond approaches Hoffer and orders him to wake up. The man gets up and asks the gentleman what's the matter. Raymond asks if he is in love with his mother. Hoffer gives a positive answer. Raymond is surprised and says whether Hoffer will obey him. He asks if Hoffer will come as soon as he takes him. If he says to give it, then Hoffer will obediently wait. If Ray tells him to bring something, then Hoffer will bring it so that the young man does not ask. He says no bickering and always obey his instructions. And for all this, he will allocate time to meet with him. 
Raymond sits down and haughtily asks if Hoffer will become his faithful dog. Hoffer says he totally agrees. Hoffer says that if the young man allows him to be near him, and he will go with him even to hell. If the prince wishes for something, he will fulfill any wish, even if it is impossible. Raymond thinks Hoffer scares him. But now, if you think about it, he has more allies besides the master and Maria, and an ally who will definitely not betray, and how many of his people will obey him. Raymond says he needs Hoffer to help him right now. After a while, Bossa sees everything and says that Chris and Raymond went to rescue Maria, but why did they bring Mr. Hoffer with them? Raymond says he's going to tell you now. He orders the man to introduce himself. Hoffer says his name is Hoffer Cassidy and he is Prince Raymond's faithful dog. Raymond says that he was familiar with him and this whole incident happened because of insufficient training. He won't kidnap her anymore. Bossa says it's the first time he's heard it. Raymond replies that he will explain everything later in the presence of General Baltzar. Raymond thinks he lied about knowing Hoffer. He will be able to use Hoffer in the power struggle between Maya and Karina's factions. The boss says that the faithful dog kidnapped the master's servant, and in general, Hoffer is an adult, but he is a dog. The man says he has nothing against it. The boss asks Maria if she is okay. Maria says that thanks to Prince Raymond, she is fine. Then the boss answers, the girl is going to marry Mr. Hoffer. Even though Maria is from the Grimaldi family, her honor will still be tarnished. Whatever happened there, but the girl spent the night in the Cassinely mansion. In addition, Mr. Hoffer and Ms. Maria were a potential couple, although they eventually broke up. Maria began to blush. Basso continues and says what rumors will go when people find out that Mr. Hoffer kidnapped her in order to get Raymond. The girl becomes uncomfortable, but Hoffer approaches the boss and with a threatening face says that the young man is not behaving too rudely. He says how happy he would be if he could get Mr. Raymond. He's ready to die just thinking about it. Raymond says that's enough. That's not what he wanted Hoffer to say. The man asks for forgiveness. Raymond turns to the boss and says that if absolutely necessary, he will personally find a partner for Maria. Bossa says that means Raymond is ready to give up so that Maria is happily married. Those who want to get close to him in the first rows will call Maria to marry and other guys will not want all this hassle. Maria becomes very sad and uncomfortable. Then Chris appears between Kajima and Maria. He says there's nothing to worry about. The boss asks if this means that Chris will take Mistress Maria for himself. Chris gives a positive answer. Maria is surprised. Everyone is surprised. Chris turns to the girl and says that when he heard that she had been kidnapped, he could not find a place for himself. They have always been there, and if he does not suit her, then until she finds a more worthy partner, he will protect her and her honor. But if his Maria is enough, then he won't regret it. The man sits on his knee and tells the girl that he loves her. Although he is an ordinary commoner, not an aristocrat, but he asks if the girl could give him a chance. Maria blushes all over and tears come to her eyes. Chris turns to Kajimo and says that something is wrong. If a man makes an unnecessary fuss about this, then he will have to talk to the boss personally. The one who will discuss the girl he loves with all his heart, then he will get no mercy from him. Kajimo says he wasn't going to say anything. He turns to Raymond and asks what he thinks about it and if he is against it. Raymond was shaking all over, and then he started crying and screaming with happiness. Kajimo asks his highness to pull himself together. After a while, Chris took Maria with him to ride a horse. The man asked the girl if she was comfortable. Maria replied that everything was fine. Chris says that he left the prince on Kajimo, so his heart is restless. Maria said it was better that way than to leave it to Mr. Hoffer. Meanwhile, Hoffer was riding next to him and says that Prince Raymond has silky skin, such as he can't even touch it. Raymond rode behind with Kajimo and cried. Bossa told his highness not to forget to breathe. Raymond said he was right. He has to see Chris and Maria's children, but if they are together, he will suffocate with happiness. After a while, Balsa listened to the report and said that it meant Hoffer admits that he kidnapped the daughter of the Grimaldi family. The man responds positively, but says he didn't plan anything bad. Balsar says that Maria is Prince Raymond's confidante. Does Hoffer mean that he deliberately pretended to be a kidnapper and made his way past the guards? He doesn't quite understand them. Hoffer said that was enough and clapped his hands. He asks if there is nothing more important than discussing this issue. Balsar tells Hoffer to think about the kingdom and what shame he could bring on the Grimaldi family. Hoffer says it won't happen again. Prince Raymond told him not to do that to Maria anymore. Things are like this. Hoffer was one of those who wrote letters to Raymond. But it seems that the letters that came from Hoffer Maria burned safely, so they met for the first time. They pretended to have communicated before. Hoffer will pretend that he sent letters to Raymond anonymously. The young man did not know the sender's name or what he looked like. Hoffer wrote under the pseudonym Pachai. 
he hid his identity from Raymond because he was afraid that he would not be able to continue the correspondence if he was discovered. For the same reason, Raymond did not try to find out about it. Now that he accidentally found out that Hoffer is Pachai, they can communicate face to face. Right now, a boss sent by General Beltsar from the Karina faction is hanging around next to him, and Ray secretly communicated with Hoffer from the faction. But in fact not. This conflict should be enough to distract all factions from Jean for a while. Baltzar will think about whether this is exactly true, but looking at Hoffer's fanaticism, he will lose any doubts. Baltza says that there is no choice anyway, so he will believe the head of the Cassinely family. As for the further protection of the prince, Kajimo continues to guard his highness, Chris returns to guard Maria and Prince Raymond. Baltzar then asks what Mr. Hoffer will do next. Hoffer asks Raymond what they will do next. Raymond says that Hoffer can return to the mansion. The young man tells Baltzar that he will return to the mansion. Baltzar asks why he came at all then. He smiles and says goodbye to Prince Raymond. He says he would like to have a little more chat with him, but he apologizes for bothering him. When Hoffer left the room and the door slammed, Balza knocked on the table and exhaled. He said he was very annoyed with Hoffer. He asks who constantly has to clean up for him. Then the man turns to Prince Raymond. She asks why they trusted a man like Hoffer at all. Raymond didn't understand the question, but Baltzar started shouting that Raymond really didn't understand what was going on. Hoffer is the man who displaced his father to take his place to fulfill his desires. In addition, he constantly draws him into all sorts of problems. Baltzar says he'd rather not be a duke at all than someone like Hoffer. Unlike him, he is devoted to his kingdom. They say his predecessor was a man with a tender heart. Hoffer didn't inherit anything from him at all. Raymond says that from now on he will keep Hoffer on a leash, so Baltzar need not worry. Baltzar says that he should be glad that such a burden was on the shoulders of a child or be glad that his burden has decreased. Raymond didn't understand what Hoffer had done to Baltzar. Then the man says that he wanted to discuss something else. He asks if Raymond will answer his question. Ray remembers that he made a promise to Baltzar. He asks about the man's question. Baltzar begins to speak, and the young man's heart began to beat faster. Suddenly Baltzar asks what Raymond thinks about his beloved daughter Lindra. He asks him to understand and says that he is just really interested. Ray wouldn't mind if Lindra became his fiancé. Raymond says that he would like a love marriage, so he has not yet considered Lindra as a bride. Baltzar says he wants to get to know his daughter better. Raymond said Baltzar was pushing him. The man says that it is natural for a father to try to help his daughter in love. He remembers how his daughter resorted to him and said that she wanted to go to the palace to see Prince Raymond, and also how she tried to engage in various hobbies in order to become worthy for Prince Raymond. She also started fencing to become stronger and protect Prince Raymond. She asks the men if maybe Raymond wants to at least meet her. The young man tells Baltzar to understand him correctly. He's weak, so he won't be able to protect Lindra if something happens. He doesn't want to take responsibility for her life, so he can't meet her. Baltzar asks that if something happens, he will definitely be there to protect his daughter and Prince Raymond. The young man thinks that, perhaps, everything sounds so simple for him, but then what position will he be in? Ray says how he will feel if he can't do anything. Baltzar sighed and called Remen stubborn. The young man said that he was rather a strong spirit, and then smiled. Then Baltzar seriously turned to Raymond and asked him to tell honestly if he really had support. He's just not sure that the young man really communicated with people from Maya's faction, including Hoffer. Raymond wondered if Baltzar was really so worried about him, then he should make sure that Baltzar was not his enemy. The young man replies that he has support, but he will not say that he supports him, because they are not so close to each other yet. Baltzar wants to add his word, but Raymond flatly says that their conversation is over. He bows and says that he will go to his room, because Baltzar has added a lot of work because of the young man, so Ray relies on a man. Kajimo happily wants to say that he will take the young man to his room, but suddenly Raymond's index finger appears right in front of him. The main character straight ahead tells the boss to stop. Baltzar and Kajimo did not understand what was happening and why the young man stopped him. Raymond puffs out his cheeks and pushes Maria with Chris and tells Kajimo that he doesn't need an escort who is rude to him and Maria. He tells Baltzar that if he sends Kajima to him again, he must first teach him manners. Raymond thinks he hasn't forgiven Kajimo or anything like that yet. He is not going to be silent when someone dear to him, that is, Maria, is offended. He makes a childish grimace and thinks that until the boss apologizes, they will not meet with him. Then the door slams shut. Bossa smiles. Baltzar asks what he has done. The young man replies that he thought that if he angered his highness, 
he would tell everything about Hoffer. Balzar said that the boss behaves rudely with everyone except Balzar, then it makes the man feel special. But this time the young man made a mistake. The boss sighs sadly and asks Mr. Balzar for forgiveness. The man replies that wouldn't it be better for him to leave his apologies for Prince Raymond. The boss smiles and salutes, saying that everything is right and he will do everything possible to be useful to Balzar. The man asks the young man to be a little serious. The young man replies that as Mr. Gerard orders. He says that Balzar saved his life, so he is ready to do anything for him. He asks to use it as it pleases Balzar. Balzar asks the boss to stop his sugary speeches because he had already told him everything. Kajimo laughed and agreed. Balzar puts his hands in his ears and thinks that Hoffer and Herzen are always fooling around, and why he is constantly surrounded by some psychos. He wants at least one normal servant. After a while Maria, Chris, Raymond and Jean were going to have tea. Raymond asked Chris and Maria to sit down and have tea with them. Maria and Chris awkwardly sat down next to each other. A slight blush appeared on Maria's cheeks. Jean noticed this and thought about their behavior. Suddenly it dawned on him, and he shouted that it was really Nyarukos and Maria. Before he could finish, he started congratulating the two. He said that he always thought how wonderful it would be if they got married. Chris thanked Jean for the congratulations, but said that he had not yet received a response. Maria said she was going to tell him as soon as they decided everything. She confusedly said that she had told her father about what Mr. Chris had told her. Raymond and Jean thought that Maria seemed to have agreed. Chris asked the girl if it really meant something important. Raymond jumped up and said that they would go to the next room, and they should use this room together. Jean supported his brother. Jean told Chris and Maria to take their time. Chris turns to Maria and tells her to continue the conversation. Maria turned to the man in a panic. Chris seriously told the girl that if she had a place for him in her heart, then he would be insanely happy. Maria giggled and smiled sweetly in response. The girl took Chris by the hand and told the man not to doubt it. Chris said he was going to talk to Duke Grimaldi and with the blessing of Maria's father. Jean and Raymond were eavesdropping on the conversation. Chris said he wanted to talk about their future together. Just a lot of days, or rather months. A little girl with black hair was running along the corridor of the castle. She barely reaches the door handle, and then enters the room where the young man was standing. The girl waves and greets her brother Raymond. Raymond was already 12 years old. Now the story is transferred to the past, when Prince Raymond was born. Maya tearfully told her newborn son that he would become the next ruler of this country. Maria's cup fell out of her hands and broke. The girl in shock did not understand what Mrs. Maya was saying. A few months before Prince Raymond was born, Maria's father told her that she would become Maya's new maid. The girl said that she understood everything. Princess of the Ost Empire, Maya. It's like she doesn't understand what position she's in. Her mood is terribly changeable and there are a lot of rumors that the maids can't stand it and quit. Maria was standing in front of the door and preparing to knock. She was afraid, but it was all for the sake of her family. The girl said she was coming into the room. Maya shouted that Maria was late and asked how long it was possible to keep her waiting. The girl apologized for her mistake. Maya said it didn't matter. She clapped next to her and told the girl to stop standing there and went into the room and sat down next to her because Maya wants to talk to her. Maria was surprised that Maya offered to sit next to her. Then Maya asked her to tell her about herself. Maria realized that Maya was more friendly than she had imagined. Maya asked if Maria had a fiancé. The girl replied that she did not. Maya asked what kind of person he was. The girl answered whether Maya was married to his majesty. Maya froze. Maya turned away and told Maria to forget about him, and then told her to get up. Maria was surprised. The marriage of Abram and Maya was for convenience, and when your husband is a man who does not visit for more than a year, then something terrible will happen on the heart. Maria stood up and said that her potential fiancé was Mr. Hoffer. Maya was surprised. Maria continued and said that they had been wooed when they were children, but Hoffer seemed very boring to her. That's how their potential wedding came to naught, and he, I must say, is glad of it. Maya asked if she loved him. Maria replied that she had never thought about such things, because all she had in her head was that one should get married for the sake of her family. He should like her so much that he wants to be with her. Maya touches her stomach and says that she is very interested that maybe someday Abram will like her. A few months later, Raymond, Maya's son, was born. The girl said that his eyes were green like his father's, and his hair was dark like her own. Maria thought that the birth went well, but she did not understand why the girl was crying. Suddenly Maria heard Maya say that her son would become the next king of the Centauro kingdom. Maya dropped the jug and apologized, saying she would clean it up. Everyone was whispering about Maya's words. They didn't understand what kind of king they were talking about and what Maya was saying, 
Because Raymond is only the seventh prince, and this is impossible. Varia realized that she had to protect the prince from the attention of the aristocrats. Due to the nature of Mrs. Maya, she will not be able to raise a child. She doesn't understand why she has to sacrifice herself for her family. She begged for someone to replace her. Suddenly Chris turned to the girl and asked if she was okay. The man also said that there is a lot of blood during childbirth and not everyone can stand the sight and smell of it. She offered the girl to take her to a place where she could rest. After a while Chris asked her if she needed to get her something to drink, but Maria turned out to be. Chris asked if the girl was crying because of Prince Raymond. He said that Maria was still young and inexperienced, but if she was scared, he would be able to support her. Coincidentally, he was also chosen to be the personal protectors of Mrs. Maya's child. If Maria is restless alone, then the two of them will somehow cope. The girl said her name was Maria Grimaldi, and the man introduced himself as Chris Narukos, but Mrs. Maria can just call him Chris. After a while, Maria held Raymond in her arms and said that he had a fever. Chris said that he would call a doctor, and the girl should calm down. Many even whispered that the child belonged to shameless Maria, but Chris told the girl not to pay attention to it. Raymond had already begun to pronounce sounds and Chris thought that at this rate, his highness would soon say his first word. Maria said she thought so too. Recently, she has seriously fallen in love with Prince Raymond. Although he is not her son, but for some reason, when she sees him smile, she calms down from it. Chris said he understood the girl. He doesn't understand a single word of what Raymond is trying to say, but his touch and his smile make his heart flutter. Maria felt something from his words. Maria said that when he grows up, he will be able to go to various events and take girls with him. Maybe one of them will become his bride. Raymond asked Maria if she also goes to events. The girl said that it was more important for her to spend time with the prince. The girl said that there were enough stories for today. Raymond grabs the girl by the hem of her skirt and asks her to tell him more. Maria understands that the look shows that Raymond is trying to hide it, but he needs love like any other child. She made a decision that she would become a mother for Raymond, and Mr. Chris would be next to her. Chris was standing in the back and didn't understand what was going on. Maria shuddered. Chris asked if the girl had a fever because she blushed. He asked her not to worry because everything is fine. Suddenly Maria's legs gave way and she fell right on Chris. The man was scared. After a while, the girl woke up in bed. The man said that according to the doctor, the girl caught a cold. Chris said that when she fell in front of his eyes, he was very scared for her, so he said that there was no need to make her worry anymore. Chris leaves the room because it's time for him to return to his post. The girl squeezed the pillow and said that she did not expect this in any way. Chris remembered Maria's face. He thought that even though it was completely wrong, but he even liked it. A few years later, Maya said that Maria was a real beauty. Maria thanked the girl from the bottom of her heart that she took up makeup on her face. Maya said that it was not necessary to thank her, because it was an important day for her maid. Maya is about to leave and says she needs to get ready too. Mary did not realize that by becoming a servant of the mistress, she would find her real happiness. If she gets married, she will probably see Prince Raymond less often, but she is sure that he is most happy for her. It was he who showed her this way, so she has no reason to let go of her hands. Nothing and no one should stop him on the way to his own happiness. The girl is sitting in a wedding dress and says that her happiness is so close and no one else will lead her astray. Chris comes into the room and asks the girl if she is ready. Maria turns around and says she's ready. Lovers are ready to go to a bright future. The main character was reborn in a world where there are five big countries and 19 small ones. He had finally arrived at the biggest academy in this world. He looked at his brother Bertrand and asked what was wrong with him. Bertrand replies that it's nothing, he just can't get used to his new hair color. Raymond adjusts his glasses and says that if he looks like this, no one will guess that he is from the royal family. Bertrand dejectedly says that he will be in the academic city and if there are problems, then Raymond should come to him immediately. The young man said that there was no need to worry, because everything was fine and he was no longer a child. He says goodbye to the teacher Bertrand and says that he relies on him. From that day on, Raymond's new academic life at the academy begins. A year ago, Raymond squeezed two cute burdens and said that they had grown up very much. Then he turns to Maria and Chris and says that they recently had their third child, a girl named Aurora. Maria said it was all right. Raymond was 12 years old. After that incident, Maria and Chris got married and immediately had children. In order to raise a child, Maria had to leave the position of a servant. The new maid named Irina Pritsenko came from a count's family from the north of the kingdom. She became Raymond's maid to find a groom. He doesn't even want to understand why they decided that by becoming his servant, they would be able to find a husband. 
The two eldest children of Maria and Chris were named Zenon and Nestor. Raymond asked how they were doing. Zeno replied that he was fine, and Nestor replied that he had read all the books that Raymond had given him last year. Then Raymond heard a knock on the door. Instantly, his younger sister, Elle, runs into the room. Raymond thinks Elle is the best sister and the sweetest sister. Maria said that they had not seen Mrs. Elfrida for a long time and that the girl had become even nicer. The girl grins and says that Maria has also become even more beautiful. Chris said that Mrs. Elfrida studies hard. He sees and notices the effort. Elle says that she works every day to grow up to be a worthy lady. Raymond thinks the girl is very beautiful, and her character strongly reminds him of his mother's. The young man jumps out behind Elle, Zeno and Nestor to frighten them. He hugs them and says they're all so cute. Maria asks if His Highness really has a social debut this year. Raymond responds positively and says that brother Jean is already burning with impatience. Jean for some reason tried to capture the image of Raymond in the picture. Brother Andre sewed a bunch of outfits for him, and Raymond's father was already buzzing everyone's ears that his son was going out to people. Maria said that Mrs. Leandra from the Baltzar family will also be at this social debut. Raymond remembers that he was offered to get engaged to her. Raymond says he knows, but he hasn't thought about the wedding yet, because he wouldn't want to ruin the girl's life because of the wedding. Maria said that she knows that the young man always thinks about others first, but she is sure that after talking to her, he will still think about the answer. Raymond says that if a girl still likes him, then maybe he will think about what to answer her. Chris says that if anything happens, he will be able to protect him and Raymond's fiancé. For this, he is ready to give his body, soul and his weapon, because Chris is the sword and shield of Prince Raymond. Chris says that he wants to protect everything that is dear to him and he asks Raymond to be sure that he can do it. Raymond thought Chris was very cool. At this time, a girl with gorgeous blonde curls was engaged in fencing and even cut a wooden mannequin. The girl's hands were covered with calluses. Baltzar approached the girl and said that there was enough training for today. That girl was Lindra. Her father said she needed to prepare for her social debut. After a while, the man was riding in the carriage and said that he was the son of Abram and Maya, and he was looking forward to meeting his nephew. The man said that Maya had told him about her son from letters, but this would be their first meeting. He will definitely invite him to the Ost Empire. The man looks at his son and says that he is his cousin, but does he really not want to see him? The young man's name was Wilhelm. He was very handsome. His eyes were narrow and his hair was jet black. There was a small mole under his lower lip. Towards evening Irina told the prince that everything was ready, and the prince looked just fine. The young man thanked his maid. Raymond realized that the outfit was too pretentious and there were too many details. Dancing and walking in this costume is very uncomfortable. When this is all over, he will finally be able to enter the academy. Suddenly, Jean calls out to Raymond. The young man congratulates his brother on his 12th birthday. He approaches him and gives him his gift, a purple Antaros. The young man attaches a flower to Raymond's ear. Jean says that Antaros can mean different things, depending on the color. If the young man remembers, then his red color means that the one who gave this flower will always love the one to whom it was given. The same color that Jean gave to Raymond means perfect beauty. Jean says that Raymond looks just perfect today. John asked them to stop already. Growing up, Jean and John became real beauties. The blood of the elves has clearly had a positive effect on them, and they are also very tall. Raymond realized that even in such clothes he could not compare with them. John asked Jean to listen and told him to stop torturing Raymond. Jean, in a panic, grabbed John and began to say that his younger brother had a social debut. John asked his brother to stop. Jean said he couldn't be on pins and needles. John asks Raymond to forgive Jean. Ray said there was nothing to apologize for. He's glad to see brother John. The young man asked if John had returned from the kingdom of Nost. John congratulates Raymond on his birthday and says that he brought him a gift. He also says he's not sure Raymond will like him. Jean said he was always wondering what John was doing, and it turns out he was making a gift for Raymond. Ray asked if John really did it all by himself. John said he did it himself, but Jean came up with the design, simply because he himself is not very good at coming up with a script. John asked Jean to activate this decoration. Jean casts a spell and the ornament is attached to Raymond's ear. Raymond says that John and Jean's gift is just wonderful, and he will cherish it. Jean said that if Ray wants to take it off, then you just need to touch it and cast a spell. Ray thanked his brothers. John says it seems it's time to go. Jean said that if they didn't hurry, his father wouldn't wait and would come for him himself. John confirmed his brother's words and asked if Raymond was ready for his exit. Ray responded positively. Finally, the brothers come out to everyone. The girls were delighted with the beauty of Prince Raymond.
They immediately surrounded him and asked him to dance with the girls. They started asking who would be the first. Raymond realized that it was hard to be popular. Suddenly there was a girl in the back and she said that everyone else was just giving his highness problems. She says that if the girls are going to argue among themselves, then they'd better go and find another place. The girl was just beautiful and Raymond recognized her as Lindra. Raymond was surprised at how much Lindra had changed. The girl said that she was glad to meet his highness Prince Raymond. She says her name is Lindra Baltzar. She asked if he remembered her. Raymond smiles and says that of course he remembers the girl. Lindra smiled and was very happy. The other girls recognized her as Lindra from the Baltzar family. The girl said that, probably, the other girls were very annoying. Raymond asked if the girl was really going to apologize for them. The girl gave a negative answer. She, as the daughter of a duke, should be a worthy role model and it is her responsibility not to let them give the prince problems. Raymond understands that the girl is worried, but she is still as sweet. Suddenly he notices her flushed face and then sits on his knee and says that they have finally met and will the girl give him a dance. Lindra happily agrees. Raymond and Lindra begin to spin in a delightful dance. He was smiling and Lindra could feel her heart beating from it. Then the young man asks if Lindra is going to enter the academy. The girl nervously replied that she was going to do it. He says that he doesn't really like such noisy parties, but they will meet at the academy again and says that it will be much more fun with her there. The girl is very embarrassed by these words and his smile. Raymond bows and says it's time for him to leave. The girl puts her palms to her face and says that it's just not fair to have such a smile. Raymond says he should have danced at least once, but luckily he managed. He is very glad that he danced with his friend. Suddenly someone says that he thought Raymond was still a child. These young men turned out to be Andre. He also says that the outfit suits the young man very well and he still did not make a mistake with the choice of design. Raymond asks how Andre could have made a mistake in the first place. Andre says Raymond says such wonderful things. Andre then notices Raymond's earring and asks about it. He also notices a pearl inside and says it's a dragon pearl. Raymond says that Jean and John gave it to him. Andre says that this decoration suits him very well, and the pearl of dragons in the language of flowers means you are my light. For Jean, who suffered from poor health all his life, and for John, who could not wield magic at all, Raymond has become a real saving light. He says that Ray loves him no less, and then kisses Raymond on the forehead. Raymond thinks that if Andre were a girl, they would be misunderstood. If you think about it, all his brothers are kind and extremely beautiful. If they worked in a host club, everyone would quickly become the best in Japan. Andre says that there is no need for this because he will choose his own partner. Andre says that girls are a real storehouse of information, especially since he likes to be the center of attention of cute girls. He tells Raymond to think that spending time with girls is his hobby. He turns around and says it's time for him to go. The girls have already gathered in anticipation of Mr. Andre. Then someone grabs Raymond by the shoulder. It turns out to be Orlando's brother. He asks his brother why it was necessary to frighten him so much. Orlando apologizes. Suddenly a girl comes up to them and tells Orlando that next to him is his little brother, about whom he has told so much. He says that the girl speaks correctly, and then offers Raymond to meet his fiancée, Francisca. The girl introduces herself as Francisca Aukidens. Raymond kisses the back of her hand and says that he is very pleased to meet Mrs. Francisca. He also introduces himself as Orlando's younger brother, Raymond. The girl giggles and says that Raymond is very cute. The young man asks if they are going to his father now. Orlando gives a positive answer. Fran asks what's wrong with Orlando's face and if he's relaxing too much at such an evening. Orlando giggles and apologizes. He says he adores Fran very much and he is so happy to finally introduce her to his family. Fran took a sip with a serious face. The girl says Orlando had such a cute face right now. She asked to see it again. Orlando said he was very shy. Raymond watches them and thinks that what is happening reminds him of Otto. Only Orlando is a shy girl and Fran is a confident guy. He congratulates both of them. Then Orlando says he kind of said he wanted to travel in the future. Orlando says that if he marries Fran, he will become the king of the kingdom of Aukidens. Of course, the main one will still be Fran, but he will also help a little. Therefore, when Ray enters the academy, he must definitely come to them. He also says that the two of them will be waiting for him. Raymond says that if he is not disturbed, he will definitely come to brother Orlando and sister Francis. Fran says Orlando's little brother is really cute. Orlando said he was talking about it. Ray asked me not to look at him like that. Raymond went on and wiped his face because he was ashamed. Suddenly a man picks up the young man. 
It turned out to be Abram, Raymond's father. The man asks the young man how he liked the party. The man smiles and says that Raymond has become noticeably heavier. Raymond was still a little boy when Abram last took him in his arms like that. Abram asks if Maya has been doing well lately. Raymond thinks that now she takes care of her sister L, and there are always a lot of people around her. Recently, they have become less likely to communicate. Maybe Raymond is even a little lonely, but he is glad to see his mother so happy. The man turns to his son and tells him to believe that although he and his mother communicate less often, she is madly in love with the young man. He also loves Raymond, Meyer and Elfrida. He says he wants his whole family to be happy. Then Abram asks why his son is blushing so much. Everyone around realized that his majesty got along well with the prince and they looked like a happy family. Ray wonders if the whole family really wants to embarrass him today. Abram started trying to kiss his son. Raymond looked at his brothers and realized that they had really all been through all this. He understands that he has to go through all this too, but however he has a plan to go on the attack. The young man hugs his father. He says he is very happy, because both Abram and Abram and brother all love Raymond, and Raymond loves his father and thanks him for everything. The man begins to cry with happiness and starts spinning with his son. He says his son is an angel descended from heaven. Suddenly a man shouts at them. He says he understands that Ray is very nice, but Abram really shouldn't mock his nephew at all. Abram pronounces the man's name, Oswald Kaiser. He also says he thought the man wasn't coming. Oswald apologized to Abram and said that there had been a lot of monsters in the mountains lately, so they were a little late. Raymond realized that the man next to his father was Oswald Ost, his uncle. Oswald is the emperor of the Ost Empire, and he is also the brother of Raymond's mother. The man said he had been informed that his nephew was the cutest in the palace. He wonders if Abram told Raymond about Oswald. Ray says that dad and mom told him about his uncle. Oswald said he knew a lot from the letters. He found out that Ray was doing various studies with Bertrand. Raymond said he wouldn't call it research. Of course, he was able to help John and Jean, but he rather just shared his observations. Oswald pats Raymond on the head and says that he is so small, but already a decent man. Somehow Ray has to use his mind for the sake of his uncle and his empire. He says they have business with Raymond's father, so they have to go. Raymond straightens his hair and thinks his uncle is very friendly. Suddenly, Raymond feels some kind of heavy gaze on him. He turns his head. Suddenly he turns around and sees Wilhelm standing nearby. The young man grins and looks menacingly at the young man. Then he turns around and walks away. Raymond didn't understand what it was. A few days earlier, Raymond and Bertrand had been studying together in the study. The young man asked if Raymond was sure that he wanted to go to the academy this year. The young man replied that he had planned it that way. Raymond said that after his release into the people, the factions of Karina and Maya will begin to show signs of attention to him much more actively. He would like to avoid this. Bertrand asked if the young man would hide his identity. Raymond gave a positive answer and said that he would not like to be exposed. Centauro is right in the middle of this world. All roads lead to Centauro, so the kingdom has become a collection of all the scientific knowledge of the world. Therefore, there is a first-class level of education here. Many people enter the Centauro Academy. The size of the academy is so huge. The academic campus of the Centauro Academy has become a full-fledged city. Academy students live and study in the city without parental supervision. He receives a first-class education from his brother Bertrand, and he does not need to enter the academy. But if you want to become an adventurer, you cannot do without an education at the academy. After all, the academy can provide the experience of exploring dungeons, ruins and fighting monsters, and depending on their result in the group, students can get recommendations for joining guilds. He does not want to shine his status in the academy, so he will have to disguise himself. Raymond turns to Bertrand and says that he will study at the academy under a different name, so if he sees his younger brother, he should not shout at the whole academy. A few days later, Irina shouted to the entire royal palace that Raymond was not going to take her to the academy with him. Raymond said he wouldn't take anyone to the academy with him. He already says that he is going to the academy to study and not to shine his royal status. Since he's not from the royal family, he doesn't need servants. Irina asks what the prince will do with the food. Raymond replies that there are restaurants and grocery stores in the academic city so there should be no problems with food. The young man replies that he will work and cope with it. Irina was shocked by the young man's words. Raymond says that he is not going to take anyone with him, so he says goodbye to the girl. Irina, in a panic, tries to say something to the young man, but he does not pay attention to her and leaves. Walking along the corridor of the palace, Maya stops him. The girl asked if her son was really going to go to the academy. Raymond gives a positive answer. Maya began to sob and said that she thought the young man would change his mind. 
Raymond asked mom to calm down. He says he will definitely come back, and the time will fly by quickly. Maya says she was just starting to think that her relationship with Raymond and her relationship with Abram were starting to get better. Raymond realizes that Maya doesn't want to be a bad mother like before. He says his home is here and the girl is her family. If he goes to the academy, he won't love his family any less. Raymond says he will write letters and will come during the long holidays. Maya says she will be waiting here for her sweet Raymond. Then Ray says goodbye to his mom and heads down the hall. He meets Jin. The young man asks if Ray is leaving for the academy with Bertrand today. He also says that he decided to accompany his brother. He says they played together when Ray was very young, so he asked Bertrand to give them some more time. Then Jean notices the gift that John gave to the 12-year-old boys. Raymond said that he really liked the earring and if he had the opportunity, he would wear it. And moreover, Jean and John gave it to him. Jean throws herself into Raymond's arms. He says that Jean will be very lonely without him. When he leaves, they won't be able to just see each other, thanks to Raymond's help. Jean was also able to get permission to leave the palace. Raymond tells Jean to be careful. He also says that Jean should not overexert himself too much. Jean agrees with Raymond and says that if it's hard for him, he needs to come back, and when he gets lonely, he will write letters to his younger brother and he should write to him too. Jean says that Ray was going to live as a simple man, so he decided not to take servants with him, so they can't come and visit him either. Ray says it would be weird if he was visited by the royal family, but they can disguise themselves. Jean says that he understood everything and they will disguise themselves. He also says that they will come to him with John. Ray says he'll be waiting. Jean wishes her brother a good journey, and then, when Ray left, he began to cry. Raymond came out and saw brother Bertrand. The young man asked if they were finished. Ray gave a positive answer. They get into the carriage. Ray says that he will come for a long vacation. Bertrand says that, as a last resort, the academy is not a prison, and he can return whenever he wants. Raymond sadly said that now he can only think about studying at the academy. He turns to the window. Bertrand sighs and starts looking out the window too. Thirteen years have passed since his birth, and he is leaving the walls of the palace for the first time, and they did not warn Hoffer about it. There are three classes in the Centauro Academy, general primary education where commoners and aristocrats of low rank study, who could not afford teachers in childhood. Secondary education is where people who have completed primary education or passed an exam study here in their chosen specialization. There is a choice of the faculty of knights or the faculty of magic. Each student can choose his own faculty, depending on who he wants to become in the future. Senior education. Here you need to learn the basics of teaching or do specialized research. Those who have achieved good results in research or studied well in their faculty can learn to teach, and then they become something like professors. Raymond will enter the secondary education of the faculty of knights. He doesn't need to go to the faculty of magic, because Bertrand taught him everything he knew about magic, so he won't learn anything there. Bertrand wanted Ray to join his faculty. Besides, he won't be able to train with Master Chris in the academic city, so that his fencing skills will not be blunted. He will enter the Faculty of Knights. Also, many famous adventurers have left the Faculty of Knights, and Raymond wants to be one of them. Finally they arrived. Raymond asked Bertrand to wait a bit because they needed to disguise themselves. Ray runs her hands through her hair, and it turns a light shade. The young man puts on glasses and says that it's just perfect. He made his black hair ashen, and he hid his green eyes with colored glasses. It's just a perfect disguise and it's like he's become a different person. Ray asks Bertrand what's wrong. The young man replies that he just can't get used to his hair color. He thought his black curls and green eyes were beautiful. Raymond said that no one would guess that he was from the royal family, because the disguise is very good. Bertrand says that he will be in the academic city, and if there are problems, then Ray should immediately go to Bertrand. Ray said there was no need to worry because everything was fine. Ray said he wasn't a kid. Raymond then says goodbye to his brother and says that he relies on his teacher Bertrand. Bertrand smiles and says that Ray is a real genius of magic. He will be glad to see him at his faculty at any time. He calls his brother Ray Ortneck. In this academy, and from this day, his new academic life begins. One of the students of the academy saw Bertrand and asked who else he was. Ray Ortneck. Under such a person, he will be hiding in the academic city. His pseudonym to blend in with the general mass of students. If you read the opposite, you will get a Centauro in Italian. It seems obvious, but he doesn't think there is Italian in this world. And the hero's name is similar to Prince Raymond, because he was born with him in the same year. If he suddenly does not respond to his last name, it is because he comes from the village, and no one there has ever called him by his last name, so Raymond believed that he would not be revealed in this way. Raymond came to the dorm. 
He's from the royal family, so he's never lived alone. He has always been surrounded by servants, but here he will have to live like an ordinary person. His room is number 301, but somehow he's even a little worried. Suddenly a young man shouts at him. The young man greets and says that his name is Oliver and he lives in room 302 next door. He asks if the young man is also from the Faculty of Magic. Ray holds out his hand and says that he is not from the Faculty of Magic, but from the Faculty of Knights. Oliver immediately pulls his hand back. Ray asked what was wrong. Oliver angrily said that he was from the Faculty of Knights, not economic and not technical. He turns around and grunts, and an emotion of dislike is depicted on his face. Ray didn't understand what happened and what was wrong with this guy. He realized that he needed to sort out his luggage. The academy does not have a specific uniform. Instead, students wear a badge that can be used to determine which faculty students are from. And then there are the economic and technical faculties, and also the faculty of humanities. History, literature and other humanities are taught in the humanities, and as for medicine, it is an offshoot of white magic at the faculty of magic. And as for geography and natural sciences, which were in the past world, they are not in this world. If they can draw maps, then geography is not needed, and natural sciences are not given importance, since there is magic. Mary is an inseparable part of this world. Instead of electricity, they use the light of magical plants and environmentally friendly light. This is somewhat similar to the magic stones that are created in Centauro. They glow thanks to the compressed magical power that has been accumulating in the ground for many years. You can also use monster cores. This is the main way of earning money for an adventurer. However, the young man found a way to light up the room without using expensive magic stones and monster cores. He placed a dragon pearl plant in his room. If you love and take care of this plant, it will live a long life. Ray thought about Oliver and why his friendliness was gone when he said he was from the Knights faculty. He thought about the fact that the faculty of Knights and the faculty of Magicians are competing with each other. It was similar in Raymond's past world. There was also a division into faculties and schools, so conflicts arose because of such prejudices. Perhaps the same thing is happening at the Academy. Raymond is not a genius of the blade, like Master Chris, but he was taught magic by his brother Bertrand. So in order to become strong, Raymond decided to combine the sword and magic. He wanted to use both. However, if the academy has strained relations between the two faculties, then it will be extremely troublesome. He's already worried about the future, even though classes won't start until tomorrow. The next morning, Ray comes out of his room and says that he went and then realized that he lives alone and there is no one to answer him. Suddenly he notices Oliver. Ray realized that he had heard everything. Ray wishes Oliver good morning, but the young man just grins. Oliver turns around and walks away. Raymond thinks there's something wrong with this young man. He's very annoying. It annoys him that he treats him like that just because he is from the faculty of knights. Ray gets turned on out of anger and because he's tired of everything. He decided that he would bypass the faculty of magic. He shook his head and told himself to pull himself together. It's about 25 minutes on foot from the dorm to the academy, and it would be easier with a bicycle, but there are none in this world. He thinks that he might be able to recreate it in this world. We need to try to contact local inventors and this will be his number one goal. Raymond walks through the streets of the academic city and is surprised. Everything you need for the life of students at the academy can be bought here. He remembers how Abram said that he would need money to live independently at the academy, so he handed him a huge bag of money. He thinks that his father has given him a huge bag of money, but he would not like to rely on them, so he is thinking of finding a side job. Finally, Ray came to the academy. The young man was met by a girl and called the young man a new student. The young man said that he was from the faculty of knights. The girl replied that today was his first day. The girl asked if the young man knew anything about this emblem. The young man answered in the negative. The girl said that the young man had arrived at the best academy in the world. The emblem is essentially an identifier. It is also a pass. Those who don't have an emblem will be pushed away by the magic barrier. In addition, the young man should keep in mind that if a young man tries to pass through an unauthorized door, he will be punished, so he must be careful. Ray thought that the girl looked like an NPC in the game. In addition, as long as the young man has an emblem, he can make purchases in the academy's stores. Of course, the goods will be at a discount. Then the girl shows Raymond a map of the academy. The girl wishes a successful academic life. Ray thanks her. Then she tells the other young man all the same words about the fact that the emblem is essentially an identifier and is also a pass. Those who don't have an emblem will be pushed away by the magic barrier. Ray definitely thought it was an NPC. Raymond walks through the academy. He sees students practicing magic, then sees the library. 
Then he enters the classroom of the Faculty of Knights. It turns out he came first. He sits down at the end of the office and thinks that he will stand out less here. He has time before the lecture, so Ray decides to get a spell book given to him by his brother Bertrand. Bertrand said that there is more information in this book than he taught Raymond at the palace. This is usually taught in the senior courses of the Faculty of Magic, but Bertrand is sure that Ray will figure it out. Bertrand also said that Ray can also find magic for dungeons and it will definitely be useful to him. He opens the book to read, but it won't be useful for a real fight at all. Fire magic that can burn everything around, including allies, and streams of water wash everything away. All these spells only need a bunch of magicians. It is unlikely that all this can be used in a real battle. And anyway, can't a mage and a knight fight as a team? Suddenly, other students come into the classroom. They were discussing something about magicians. Then someone says that the young man is reading a book of spells. Someone even whispered that maybe the young man just got lost and confused the audience of the Faculty of Knights with the audience of the Faculty of Magic. Suddenly a young man came up to Raymond and then stamped on the table with his foot. He said that, wow, there was a magician in the audience of knights. Raymond realized that he was clearly being accosted by a guy who would only cause problems. Finally, the long, awaited educational life of the main character, Raymond, began. That's just it didn't start smoothly at all. One student is laughing at Raymond, and in the audience another student from his faculty accosted him. The young man sat and arrogantly said, looking at Raymond, that there was a magician in the audience of knights. Ray realized that he was clearly being accosted by a guy from whom there would be only one problem. The young man asked the hero what he was staring at and if he wanted to get for it. Raymond exhaled and then smiled sweetly. The young man was surprised. Ray then asked if the young man couldn't see the emblem on his chest. If he didn't even notice it, then maybe chivalry is not for him. Because with such vision and attentiveness, he will miss all the monsters. The young man got angry and asked what Ray had said there. The hero replied that judging by appearance is corny stupid and maybe he wants to personally evaluate his fencing skills. The young man angrily clicked, is Ray squishy challenging him? The hero asked why the young man was shouting and he had an unpleasant smell from his mouth. He needs to calm down. The young man said that he would kill the main character, and Ray asked the young man to tell his name, because he should know the name of the one who would defeat him. The young man says that his name is Arthur Shishikin. He orders Raymond to remember this name because it is the name of someone who will humiliate him. Raymond called Arthur Shishikin and then used a pun and nicknamed him Tuna. And then he asked if Arthur really thought that a fish could defeat a man. Suddenly a man comes into the classroom and says that the new students this year are very energetic, but he will not be able to introduce himself if they do not stop making noise. The man asks everyone to take their seats. Raymond sees the emblem of a man. Arthur shouted that he would not calm down until he punched the young man in the face, and Ray apologized to the man and said that he had given free rein to emotions because this guy ran into him with screams. Ray understood that the professor's emblem was fixed on the man, so the best option would be to shut up. Arthur was angry that Ray behaved like that, so he grabbed him by the collar and said that he was definitely freaking out and that's why he would hit him. Suddenly a teacher came up to them and said that he had made it clear that it was necessary to take their seats and stop the quarrel. Then he thinks that if Arthur has such hot blood, then he is clearly not going to sit down. He reminds the guys about collective responsibility and calls the full name of Ray and Arthur. He says that both boys can resolve their disputes on the training ground. He added that the others were coming too. It may seem too unexpected, but it will help to show the strengths of Ray and Arthur and help them understand their weaknesses. The man says that he had planned to make do with an ordinary acquaintance today, and now everyone will have to suffer because of these two. He says he expects decent fights. After a while, Ray and Arthur find themselves on the training ground with blades in their hands. The professor gives the command that they can start. Arthur immediately clutches his sword and rushes at Raymond. He says that with his gentle magician's hands, he will never be able to defeat him. Ray blocks the attack in Arthur's jump, but realizes that the young man is very fast. He is surprised by his reflexes, and Arthur just smiles at this time. The young man strikes one blow after another while Ray dodges or blocks. Arthur asked what was the matter and where Ray's fuse had gone. The young man at this time thought that it was amazing that he was still holding on at all. Raymond is far from a fencing genius. The more he trained with Master Chris, the more he realized that he would never reach this level. Now he is able to fence like an ordinary person, or a little stronger than an ordinary person if he makes an effort. Genius is 99% effort and only 1% talent. An ordinary person will never get this 1% and he will never reach 100%, but Shishikin is an unusual person. 
He clearly owns that 1% because the way he moves and the way he wields the sword, he is superior to Rey in all of this. Rey once again evades the attack. Arthur told him to stop jumping and dodging because it seems to him that Rey is mocking him. Rey said that Arthur was much stronger than him, so he is surprised, but he asks Arthur if he is sure that it was necessary to stop the attack. Arthur didn't understand what Rey was trying to say. Rey asked if Arthur had noticed that he hadn't started fighting yet. He only blocked Arthur's blows, so the young man did not understand his fighting style. He wonders if Arthur is sure that it was worth giving Rey a break. The young man smiles and says that thanks to Arthur's procrastination, he now knows how to defeat him. Arthur is enraged by Rey's smile. He says he's going to kill Rey. People from the stands thought that Rey had come up with something, but it still wouldn't help him in any way. They also thought that Arthur could seriously finish him off. Arthur makes one lunge after another. He smiles and says that Ray can only talk. The hero at this time assessed the situation with a cold look. Suddenly, Ray reached out and touched Arthur's blade. The young man noticed this and jumped back. The young man did not understand what Ray had just done, but he did not care because there is no difference, because he is confident in his victory. Suddenly, Arthur tries to attack Ray again, but suddenly his hand began to shake. He looked at the sword and realized that it had become heavier. At this time, Ray was smiling and asked if Arthur felt that the weight of his weapon had become much heavier. Arthur turned his attention to his sword and thought about the weight, but at that moment he saw Ray, who jumped up to strike. Arthur did not understand what he should do now, because he could not use a sword. Ray used a spell that increases the weight of things. To do this, he had to touch the blade. This spell only works for 10 seconds, but that's more than enough time for him to defeat Arthur. He attacks and hits the young man's hand, so that the sword falls out of his hand. Then Ray raises his hand and a magical seal with lightning bolts appears from it. The young man smiles and says that he has won. He puts his hand to Arthur's face to attack him with magic. Arthur had already prepared for the worst and therefore squeezed his eyes shut. Suddenly, a small cloud of smoke flew out of Ray's palm. Arthur opened his eyes. Ray said he said he had already won. Arthur lost because he couldn't interrupt his spell, and since this is just a training fight, there is no need to strike a direct blow. Everyone in the stands was surprised that Ray won. They couldn't understand why the knight could use magic. Suddenly some young man said that Ray was a very curious guy. Arthur grabs Ray by the collar and asks if he really looks down on him. Ray said that on the contrary, Arthur underestimated him. If he continued to attack him, then he wouldn't have a chance. Suddenly the professor came up and said that as he expected, it was a great fight. He turns to Arthur and says that this fight will be a good lesson for him. Even if his opponent is weaker, you can't relax until the very end. Then he turns to Ray Ortnick and says that he has a rather curious fighting style. However, the physique of the child, fencing is based on the strength of his body and intuition. He would definitely have lost if Arthur hadn't decided to make fun of him. Ray understands that. He understands that he has absolutely no talent for fencing, but it still hurts him. The man says that Ray is very good at magic. The activation speed and impressive control. Everything is at the highest level and thought out, so he does not understand why the young man decided to choose the faculty of knights and not the faculty of magicians. Apparently he decided to become a new kind of knight. Most of the new students are already 15 years old. But Ray is only 13, so their physiques are different. Since he can't win by force, he will use magic, because that's his fighting style. So he continued to study magic. In addition, there is the magic of increasing muscle strength and acceleration. However, it is impossible to rely on him constantly. Magic has its limits, over time its effect weakens. Using only magic alone, he can't win. His strength will be revealed in the battle in the group. He can simplify the work for his group by using buffs and debuffs, but there is a problem with creating a group. This is clear from his acquaintance with Oliver yesterday. In this world, mages are grouped with other mages and knights with other knights. Nobody even thinks about mixed groups. With strong opponents, they prefer to fight with pure firepower, without any planning. That is, they rely only on force. This is the opposite of what he wants. There is a banal class here for those who use both magic and a sword. Therefore, there are few groups in this world capable of defeating an S-rank monster, and after all, with teamwork, there would be more strong groups. Teacher Chris is an S-rank adventurer. He gained his rank by defeating an S-rank monster, a dragon. Ray doesn't think he'll ever be able to do it, so he's aiming for a balance of magic and fencing. Create a group with perfect balance. Magicians considered the faculty of knights to be a haven for a barbarian with strength instead of brains and knights considered magicians to be nerds who sit in the library all day long, and already they themselves smelled of mold. 
It's hard to work with such relationships. The professor of the Knights faculty said that he was unable to introduce himself because of the unexpected sparring. He is glad to meet everyone, because now he will observe their path. The man's name is Clovis Muller, the name of an Arank adventurer. He was also called the Dragon Knight. The man said that he had long since quit his job as an adventurer, but his fame seems to be going nowhere. Anyway, the students will have to wait for him here for a while, so they will finish here for now. Suddenly Arthur calls out to Ray and asks what kind of magic it was. According to Mr. Clovis Muller, Arthur is better at fencing and intuition. He only lost because of Raymond's magic. Ray said that his words were true, because Arthur is better than him in fencing, although on the contrary, everyone present is better than him in fencing. But to Arthur, who thinks so narrowly that he only knows how to swing a sword, he won't lose to this. Before asking questions, he could try to think for himself or look for answers himself. He never questioned what Ray did, how much time he spent on the spell, and what the activation condition was. Of course, Ray could tell Arthur everything, but if he wants Ray to tell Arthur everything, then he has to get something in return. Arthur asked what Ray wanted in return. The young man grabs him by the collar and asks him to teach him fencing. Ray said he would teach him magic, and Arthur would teach him sword skills. It will be a fair deal. Ray's lessons with the teacher were the usual fun. He didn't feel much progress because Chris was trying not to overexert him. Ray realized that this is not enough and this is not enough. Arthur said he understood, but then he said it definitely wasn't going to happen. Ray demanded that Arthur give the reason, because that way he would only benefit from learning magic. Ray didn't understand why Arthur was so stubborn. Suddenly a young man pulled Arthur by the collar and ordered him and Ray to calm down. The young man asked the two if they really hadn't let off steam yet. Arthur asked him if he was looking for trouble. The young man smiled and said that his name was Nakiri Shiro from the Faculty of Knights. Arthur said he didn't care who the young man was. Shiro asked why Arthur was always picking fights with everyone. Ray told Shiro that he was very ashamed of his friend. Shiro told Ray not to worry, because he had nothing to apologize for, because Shiro had provoked him even more. Arthur asked what Ray was doing. The young man takes Arthur by the face and tells him to be quiet and not to scream. Ray introduces himself to Shiro and says that he doesn't like being called by his last name, so he can just be called Ray. Shiro said he was glad to meet you. Ray thought Nakiri Shiro sounded like a Japanese name. Ray asked that Nakiri is probably a surname, and Shiro is a first name. Shiro was surprised, because many people think that Nakiri is a name and they are constantly confused. Nakiri is a surname. He is glad that someone understood right away. Arthur said that he calmed down and asked to be released. The young man introduced himself and said that weaklings like Ray were not interested in him. Ray realized that Arthur was deliberately trying to annoy him. If Ray is so weak, then how could he defeat Arthur? Shiro asked the guys to listen to him and asked what they were going to do now and what their plans were. Arthur said it was time for lunch now. Shiro said it was only morning, to which the young man replied that he was hungry after the battle. Shiro asked Ray what he was going to do now. The young man said that he planned to study magic in the library. Arthur said that there were only frail and weak magus sitting in the library. Ray said that only Arthur lost to this weak and frail magician. Ray and Arthur clung to each other again, and Shiro said that the guys had enough quarreling and needed to be more friendly. Shiro pulled Arthur away and said that he wanted to eat in the dining room, so they head straight to the dining room. Ray thinks Shishikin is interesting. Decision, making, reaction and body control are all at the highest level. As much as he doesn't want to admit it, he's the strongest in this class. Ray's other classmate, Shiro, is most likely from the south, because he is clearly not from the east. If he has enough strength to hold Shishikin, then he is clearly not weaker than him. Isn't there too many strong people he met on the first day, and he loses to them not only in the possession of the sword, and the magicians from the faculty of magicians, for sure, are not weaker. He's starting to think he doesn't have any talent. However, unlike them, Ray has his own way. He owns both a sword and magic, then he is sure that he can win anyone. He decides to make them play by their own rules. Against knights, they would use magic, and against magicians, he would use a sword. He will use their weaknesses against them and so gain the upper hand. However, for this he needs to work hard and study a lot. The main library of one of the leading academies in the world has the largest collection of books in the whole world. Ray was in the library. Oliver asked what the stupid knight was doing here. Shouldn't stupid knights be swinging their stupid swords at the training ground? Ray asked what was wrong with him reading magic books. Oliver was surprised that Ray was reading a magic book. Oliver asked if Ray really understood it, but the young man replied that if he didn't understand it, he wouldn't read it. The young man asked why Ray entered the faculty of knights, because they had not even been taught this yet. 
he doesn't understand the young man. Ray asked which chicken Oliver was on. He said he was on the third. By the way, he is older so Ray should speak respectfully, even though he and Ray are in different faculties. He is still older. Ray said that from their acquaintance he somehow did not want to treat Oliver with respect. Oliver said that this is the book they will be taking in the second semester of the third year. They will learn how to fight monsters, for example, dragons, creating large magic circles with ten or more people. You can't defeat such monsters alone, you need a large group. Ray says that magicians can't work alone. What a surprise this is. Oliver says of course they can't. That at the faculty of magicians, that at the faculty of knights, they teach that it is very difficult to fight alone. It's not enough just to read books. You can't become an adventurer without friends. However, if you fight group by group, then the faculty of magicians will be stronger. They will never lose to incompetent fools from the faculty of knights. Ray saw great faith in the fact that the magician would not lose. That's why this faculty of magicians is the same. Ray says Oliver is wrong. If Oliver is so self-confident, then why shouldn't he use these incompetent fools? Oliver was surprised by Ray's words and did not understand what he meant by using them. Ray said that for a strong spell, you need to draw a large magic circle, so monsters can easily interfere. Oliver said that Ray is right. That's why he says that adventurers cannot become alone. Not only magicians will tell him that. The strong side of magicians is a huge damage to magic, and weaknesses are light armor and a small reserve. Ray said that wouldn't it be better if he had someone who was distracted by himself, that is, a tank. A tank is a class in RPG games capable of distracting enemies on itself from other members of the group. In any group there should be a tank, a healer and the one who will deal damage, DD. Magicians can take on the roles of healers and DD. Knights can also be DD, and can also take the role of a tank. Faculty of Magicians and Faculty of Knights. If they work together, then creating groups in any orders or tasks will become easier. Oliver understands Ray's words and says he didn't even think about it. If mages and knights unite, then their utility coefficient will grow, but at the moment both faculty do not get along at all. But none of them even thought about teaming up with the knights. They believed that stupid people who did not possess magic would only get in the way. Ray realizes that the hatred has slipped through again. However, Oliver holds out his hand to Ray and says that the young man is not like them all. He says it's nice to meet you and his name is Oliver Wood. Ray thinks that if he enlists the support of Oliver from the faculty of magicians, then his study of magic will progress. The young man introduces himself as Ray Ortneck. He says he doesn't like being called by his last name, so he can just call him Ray. Oliver says that Ray's idea surprised him very much and he didn't even think about it, and he himself was also very interested in him. Ray asked about Oliver's teacher. The young man said that he was not alone. Oliver remembered that the faculty of knights has only one teacher, and he alone teaches them the sciences, history, and the art of fighting. At the faculty of magicians, everything is different. Depending on what kind of magic they have a lesson in, the teachers change. This system is better suited for deeper study of disciplines. Ray finds an analogy in both middle and high schools. Oliver asks what he means. Ray says that in general, how will teachers react to this idea with cooperation? Oliver says he's not sure because different teachers have different opinions. Ray suggests that maybe it would be worth talking to them and asking. Oliver says that the teachers of their faculty are not so easy to catch. Suddenly Bertrand passes by. Ray starts screaming and pointing at Bertrand. Oliver is surprised by Ray's behavior. Ray wants to call his brother, but remembers that at the academy he hides that he is a member of the royal family. They can't communicate like in the palace. If he calls Bertrand a brother, he will definitely reveal himself. Oliver, horrified, asked why Ray had called Bertrand's teacher. Ray called the teacher. Bertrand looks at Oliver and says that he, for example, remembers him, because he was definitely in his class. Then he looks at Ray. The young man says that he is from the faculty of knights and his name is Ray Ortneck. He is a new student and is in his first year of study. He opens the map of the academy and offers to talk elsewhere. After a while they stay in the conference room. Bertrand looks around and says that it's very cramped here. Ray says it's just that his room is probably too big. Bertrand asks if the young man really thinks so. Oliver is shaking all over with fear and says that it's very bad because teacher Bertrand is from the royal family. He does not understand how it is possible to communicate so freely with a member of the royal family. 
Bertrand asks why Ray called him here. Ray says he wanted to ask if the teacher would like to do research together. Oliver grabbed Raymond's shoulder in shock. Oliver can't stand it and starts shouting to Ray that the teacher is against it because he is the second prince of the Centauro kingdom. So he is also a famous researcher. He and Ray are ordinary people, that is, commoners, and the fact that they are talking to a royal person is already a miracle. Ray thinks that if Oliver finds out that Ray is from the royal family, then Oliver's heart will stop. Ray apologizes and says that he was not allowed to finish. He says that it was about joint research in the field of magic development. Bertrand says they don't practice this because it's not necessary. Each discipline and specialty act independently. Fire means fire, and water means water. Theory, practice, hypotheses. Each discipline has its own teacher assigned to it, who is best versed in this discipline. The only thing that all the specialties of the Faculty of Magic have in common is the theory of magic. Ray says that it means what specialty each student will develop and depends on whether the teacher will be able to persuade the student to study his specialty. Bertrand gives a positive answer, and then adds that this means that magic is not combined in the academy either. Bertrand with sparkling eyes, who loves to listen very much, asks Ray to explain everything to him. Ray asks how the professor thinks the lightning effect can be enhanced. Bertrand asks if it's not enough just to pour in more magic power. Ray says that in this case, the power of magic will depend only on the amount of magic power of the magician. Of course, people with high magic power will not see the problem, but magicians with low magic power will immediately be branded the weakest. But if you think through a battle plan, you can safely win strong opponents. Ray says it's actually not that hard to enhance the lightning effect. Ray asks what lightning is and why it happens. The whole secret lies in this. Oliver says that lightning often strikes lightning rods, so you need to use metal. Bertrand says that lightning strikes from the clouds, so it has something to do with rain, that is, with water. Ray says that lightning often strikes tall objects, and what gets wet after the rain conducts electricity better. But if they wear precious metals on themselves, this does not mean that lightning will start hitting only you. Metals conduct electricity better than the human body, so if lightning strikes, the current will pass through the metal. In simple words, to hit the monster harder with lightning, you first need to wet it with water magic. Or you can stick a long metal object, like a spear into the enemy's body so that it serves as a lightning rod. So you can strike a more targeted blow. Bertrand says he would never have thought of it. Then he grinned and said it was very curious. He will talk to every professor and thinks that they will also find this idea interesting. Most likely, they will agree to conduct joint classes of specialties. The man thanks Ray for an interesting idea. Ray says it's not worth the thanks and thanks Bertrand for taking the time to talk. When Bertrand left, Oliver collapsed and said he was next to a member of the royal family and they were talking in private. Ray told him not to die. After a while, the young man left the academy and thought that he was very tired and it was time to go home. Then he thought that it was time to think about a side job. He doesn't want to rely on money from the royal palace. He wants to live independently so as not to create unnecessary suspicions. Suddenly someone called the young man. That person turned out to be Shiro. Ray asked where Shishikin was. Shiro replied that he said he would train, but Shiro wants to find a job, so he decided to take a walk around the city. Ray suggested that Shiro go out together because he also wanted to find a side job. Shiro said if it was true that Ray was not being sent money from home either. Ray said that nothing was being sent to him, and then asked if Shiro's homeland was far away. Shiro replied that you could say that. The village where he lived is in the middle of nowhere, far to the south of the empire, through a tunnel carved into the mountain, through a forest filled with demons. In their village, if you're weak, you won't even be able to get to the Imperial Academy. Most spend almost all of their childhood in the countryside, and when you grow up, you create a family and that's it. Shiro then asks what kind of job Ray is looking for. Ray says he hasn't decided which one yet, and then asks Shiro. Shiro says that one where he can earn a lot of money and cope with any without any problems. Then he notices an antique shop. Shiro asks Ray if he likes the store. The young man responds positively and says that he will go to this store. He asks if he will go with him. Shiro replies that he will refrain from the offer, because he doesn't understand anything about it anyway. A young man enters the store and notices some interesting product. There was a high-quality magic stone in the window, and it is sold at the same price as a disposable pen. There is definitely something wrong with the prices in this store and why everything is too cheap here. The young man asks the woman who set the prices. The woman asked what business he had. Ray says that there are only excellent products here. All price tags urgently need to be redone. Suddenly the woman began to cry. Ray was very surprised by this. Ray tries to find out why the woman suddenly started crying. 
The woman apologizes and says that the young man asked if she needed workers. Ray replied that it was true, because he was looking for a place to work part-time. The woman says that the salary will be small. The maintenance of the store costs a pretty penny. In addition, even with their low prices, there will always be another expert who wants to bargain. A woman needs an employee who will work with clients. The young man asks if the woman really wants to hire him. He says that's what he was hoping for. Suddenly someone comes into the store and says that he has returned home, calling the woman Granny. A girl appears in the doorway and calls Ray a client. The woman says she came just in time. As of today, this kid is working in this store. The woman asks the young man what his name is. A hero introduces himself as Ray. She says this girl is her granddaughter. He should listen to what she says to him. The girl holds out her hands and says her name is Julia. She will be very happy to work with the young man. The woman intervenes and says that his first job is to redo the prices. Then she slams the door behind her. The girl asks not to be offended by her grandmother. She began to behave like this after the death of Julia's father. Ray asks what happened to the girl's father. She replied that dad had gone away on business but never returned. Everyone says he was killed by monsters. The girl asks where the young man studied assessment. Ray replies that he learned it at home. Every aristocrat needs to know this. Any aristocrat should understand how much anything in front of him is worth. Julia said she learned it by looking at her parents. Dad served customers and handled most of the sales. She also tried to learn it, but she didn't understand a lot. All the current prices she wrote. However, apparently the stink is all wrong. Ray asked if she wanted to learn it. The girl asked if she really could do it. She thanked the young man. Ray said that, although he still doesn't understand a lot of things, but he can teach the basics. Ray is easily versed in quality. Comparing with the things that were in the palace, he can easily understand what a good quality thing looks like. He's a prince, so he's only seen the best. Ray thinks it would be nice if he had acquaintances from the field of trade. Suddenly Julia distracts him and says that this accessory. She thought that in their time such a thing could not be sold. After all, it was a very expensive thing. Ray says the design is old-fashioned, of course, but the gem is definitely real. If you redo the design in a modern way, then it will definitely be bought for a good price. The use on around is also oxidized, it must be silver. Ray thought maybe someone from the technical department could change the design. After a while, he finishes work and says that they worked until sunset. Suddenly Ray notices that Julia is watching him. The girl started laughing, and Ray said that if she was going to laugh, she would at least laugh out loud. The girl asks for forgiveness. 